<laughs> okay, um, good morning, and um, I want to welcome everybody to the uh, subcommittee on distance learning and innovation. Uh, my name is Greg Martin, and I am my official title for this is meeting organizer. So, uh, uh, just to remind everybody, we're we're not um, technically negotiators. That's at the main table. So this is a subcommittee. It's a little bit different. This is um, we're we're breaking new ground here. So we're all in this together. I've never done. I've been a negotiator before, but I, um, federal negotiator, but I've never served in this capacity before. So. Uh, one of the things I'm looking forward to with this is that it's a little more informal, so hopefully we don't have to spend as much time on rules and we don't have any official protocols or things like that. We will talk about that. Before we get going, though, I think it would be good for us to uh, get to know each other a little better, and uh, don't worry, there'll be no formal icebreakers. I was a trainer for 26 years, <laughs> and uh, I uh, learned to have uh, a great deal of uh, dislike for you know, tell me something about yourself nobody else knows. What's your favorite book? Um, you know, any of those things. So we're not going to we're not going to do that um, unless you really want to tell us something about yourself that nobody knows. Feel free to go ahead and do it. I will not. Uh, I won't judge you at least not publicly. Um, so again, my name is Greg Martin. And before we get going, I want to introduce the members of the federal team here that will be uh, part of this today. So I'm going to start with our uh, uh, master of ceremonies, sort of running everything and uh, taking notes. That's Scott Filter, who's right here. And um, over here is uh, our, our counsel, Denise Morelli. So she'll be with us for the duration. Over here from uh, FSA is um, David Musser. So David will be most of the agenda, the, the, the federal, like the role of talking through the issues will, it will either be uh, me or David. And we will have an agenda for you, a, a more detailed agenda for how we're going to proceed through this and which of us will be um, talking about which particular subjects. Uh, in the back, you'll see the gentleman back there is Tony Gargano. Uh, when we start, he'll be moving up to the table. Tony's going to be... Our, we don't have an official facilitator the way we do at uh, the, the head table um, in, uh, uh, for the main negotiations, but we do need, I think, to have some control over who's speaking, who's acknowledged, so I've asked Tony to serve in that capacity. So uh, when we uh, begin discussions, I think what we'll do is we'll use the same protocol they have in the main meeting. Turn your sign up, uh, your, your name tag up. Uh, Tony will acknowledge you. And that way it will go into the record because we always want to know this is being recorded. Uh, we're live streamed. So um, we want to know who's who's speaking. So that way Tony will say, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Miss Hancock or something like that. And then it will be it will be knowledge to speaking. And we'll know that. So uh, Tony will serve in that capacity. And the back table here, we have some more Ed staff. And I already forgot Jonathan's last name. Hellwink. This is Jonathan Hellwink. And uh, he's with OUS? OPE. See, I'm with the, he's with OPE. Um, and then we have our, 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 another counsel, uh, Sally Morgan, with our Office of General Counsel, is over here. And, and then finally, we have uh, Beth Daggett, and Beth's with accreditation. So some of what we'll be discussing today has uh, some overflow into accreditation, so Beth will be the person who will be leading uh, that discussion. Um, ground rules, I don't, I don't want to make this too, uh, too formal, and we could not have a three-hour debate, I guess, over what our ground rules will be, but I don't think that would serve any real purpose. So uh, a couple things. I'll just throw these out because this is an inform more of an informal meeting. And you know, if anybody has any comments or suggestions or feels that, th that they, don't, uh, they don't like any of these rules or would like to discuss them, we certainly will. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is that because we're being recorded, make certain that all your comments are directed into the microphone and that when you're not speaking and you don't want anybody to hear anything, make sure it's turned off. Um, uh, Again, you'll be acknowledged, and when you're acknowledged, you can speak. I, uh, I would like to make sure that all of us are included and uh, all of our opinions get, uh, get voiced around the table. I don't, we're not going to have any time, you know, official time limits, you know, someone saying your, your, your minute is up or whatever, but try, try to keep uh, the comments uh, direct and, and brief and to keep the conversation moving and um, not get too tied down. And I know some of these, some of these issues, some of them are not, very um, our issues. I think that there'll be a lot of agreement about across all, you know, across all sectors and political opinions or whatever. Others not so much. But I I want to keep the conversation amicable. 
Um, I, I think all of us, when we come to something like this, have to understand that you'll voice opinions that will be others will not agree with, and you have to be willing to hear those opinions um, uh, taken apart to a certain extent. But I, but I want to make certain that we all uh, remain civil. I, in most cases, when I've done this, that's that is. Been the, what's happened. Uh, every once in a while, people get a little heated, um, so just uh, bear that in mind. Uh, I'd like to refrain from any personal accusations or mentioning any, you know, I don't, obviously, if you want to refer to a sector or something like that, I have no problem with that. I'd like us to refrain from using the names of individual schools or individuals if we can, if we can avoid that, it, um, that would be great. Um, Trying to think of any other uh, any other rules. Uh, again, you know, raise your name tags to be acknowledged. Uh, breaks. We'll probably have a break at around ten fifteen, ten thirty. Well, lunch is hard and fast at twelve, uh, and we have to do that because of the way the recordings are working anyway. But it, it wouldn't matter because uh, it, I'm not very doctrinaire about many things. But when it comes to lunch, uh, you know, I do that. I've, I've never done a working lunch. If you're having a working lunch with me, you're working and I'm eating. So. Um, that's always been my way of looking at it. So uh, that's a sacrosanct thing for me. So we will take the lunch at, uh, at uh, promptly at noon. And um, as far as when we'll break today, I would like to, you know, we're scheduled to go to five, I believe. Um, don't know if we'll go right to, to five. We'll see where we are. Um, tomorrow is a Friday, and we're, it's in advance of a holiday weekend. So I'd like to let you all go a little early, maybe tomorrow, if that's, that would be a good thing, unless you're all insistent on staying until exactly five o'clock. I, I, ho I hope that won't be the case. Um, but we'll see how far we get. Uh, as far as our role, I just want to reiterate uh, the, our role. I, you probably already know this, but again, we are not negotiators. We are a subcommittee. We are to discuss the issues in front of us and take our recommendations uh, back to the, uh, the main committee. Um, and they can do with them as they see fit. I mean, I, I would hope that what comes out of here is so well thought out, so amazing that they would just look at it and go, of course, you know, we'll, we'll accept it. Um, I, I think we have a, a great opportunity, especially with some of these things, not everything. Some, some of them are a little more complicated and going to involve a little more disagreement. But I think in some of these instances, we have a real opportunity to, uh, to fix some nuts and bolts issues in, in the administration of Title IV aid, where I think there would be general agreement that across all sectors that, that something needs to be done. Maybe not, we might not all agree exactly what needs to be done, but something. Um, I would love to go back to the committee with a, with a report that uh, showed that, I guess consensus is the wrong term because we don't really reach consensus here, um, that, that shows general agreement among, amongst all of us as to what ought to be done. Uh, I recognize that might not be the case. So the way I envision it, and again, this is the first time we've ever done it, and we don't have formal protocol. So the way I envision it is that whichever of us, and we have to think about this too, whichever of us does the report back to the committee would, you know, where, we're, where, where we are in agreement, say, uh, say that. You know, the, 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 the committee, subcommittee was in agreement here uh, about these things. If there are areas where we do not agree and we, we cannot um, come to some... Uh, Again, I'm not going to use the word consensus, but something like consensus, um, that that would be reported as well. So that that individual would say, you know, members of the committee, some members favored this approach, others favored this approach. So that's where I see it going. Um, of course, we don't know what the outcome will be because this is the first time any of this has been done. I. I think a couple of you noticed yesterday. I know there were comments yesterday, and and, and I'll just. This is just the way it is. But some of what we're going to be discussing today, as you can see, uh, will, will be an overlap with accreditation, uh, some definitions. And you may have asked the question, uh, why are we dealing with that here, since it will be dealt with on the main committee? Uh, I, I will just say, because we're tasked with dealing with it here. So um, that we will do. Uh, I don't know that we need to go into great de deal of detail on some of these things that we won't have any say over at all because we're going to go back to the main committee. Well, all of it ultimately winds up at the main committee. But, but we'll, we'll try the, the best we can to, uh, to get through those. We're going to start with um, the accreditation issues today because we have Beth Daggett with us from accreditation. She's far more uh, uh, informed about those issues than either David or I are. So uh, she will be doing those. Um, trying to think if there's anything I left out. Uh, Yes. Um, who's going to report out? 
Uh, we do have – we have – how many people on this committee uh, are also on the uh, main negotiation committee? It's just you. Um, and your name again? Uh, Jillian Klein. So I would, I would propose um, – and, and, and uh, again, this is uh, – we don't have these formal – things going on here, but I would propose that we, uh, that we allow Jillian to uh, report back to the main committee uh, with the understanding that she will uh, report, uh, she may have to report something she doesn't agree with, um, just report what, what happens or report both sides, and you're fine, you're fine with that? All right. So because she's on the main committee, I think it would make sense for her to do that as opposed to making one of you come an additional day uh, here. Uh, so if you're all, is there anybody who opposes Jillian in, in that capacity? Okay, excellent. Um, uh, the other thing I think we have to think about is how we, how we approve, how we're going to approve things. Um, I, I don't know, I, I know in the main committee they use the thumbs up, thumb down, thumbs thing. Uh, how do you all feel about that? Am ambivalent? Uh, Thumbs if you <laughs> indicate that you like it by yeah. Thumbs up. Right. Uh, we'll try it. You know, we'll try to use that same protocol. So thumbs up would mean you are uh you are wholeheartedly in agreement. Thumbs to the side, I guess, is what you can live with it. Uh thumbs down is the typical Roman gladiator type thing, right? Um enough of that, right? So um okay, excellent. Uh David, something else? That's right. Denise reminds me that though I introduced the federal people, we have not introduced any of you. So uh, as we go around the room, uh, we'll start here. Uh, we already introduced the federal people, so we'll start with David, and we'll go around the room. Would you just please tell us your name, uh, what, uh, what entity you're, you're, you're from, and who you're representing? And please be sure to uh, press your microphone and say your name into it. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, David Scable, um, Higher Education Marquette University. Hi, Meredith Hancock. Um, I believe four year, mostly online. I need to double check. Uh, Thomas Edison State University. Sorry, I guess I should have been more clear. Uh, uh, what am I, private? Um, I'm not sure I'm looking here real fast. I, I think private, <laughs> private higher ed. Hi, I'm Russ Poulin with the Wichita Cooperative for Educational Te uh, Telecommunicator Technologies. I changed your name years ago. Uh, and then I represent organizations that have uh, CBE and direct assessment members. Good morning. Leah Matthews with the Distance Education Accrediting Commission. I'm representing accreditation. Good morning. Sue Hoppert with Des Moines University, and I'm representing nonprofit organizations supporting interstate agreements related to state authorizations of distance and correspondence education. I'm Mary Otto from Campbell University, and I'm representing the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities. My name is Amanda Martinez, and I'm currently going to American University and representing students. Hi, my name is Jessica Renucci. I am an attorney at the New York Legal Assistance Group, and I'm representing uh, legal services attorneys who work with students. Hi, I'm Jody Fetter from the uh, National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities, and I'm representing um, private nonprofits. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Jillian Klein from Strategic Education Incorporated. I'm their Vice President of Government Affairs. Um, Strategic Education is the parent company of Capella University and Strayer University. So I'm here representing um, for-profit institutions with experience in, dis in um, distance education and direct assessment. Good morning, everybody. My name is Rob Anderson. I'm the President of the State Higher Education Executive Officers Association, and I'm representing the State Higher Education Executive Officers. Good morning, my name is Carolyn Fast. I'm from the New York Attorney General's Office and I'm representing uh, State Attorneys General's Office. Okay, thanks. Um, and now what we'll do is uh, get started uh, with accreditation issues. And again, I'll reintroduce Beth Daggett from our accreditation group and she will be the one leading the discussion on uh, accreditation issues. Um, 
Oh, I'm sorry. We also have joining us today uh, Anne-Marie Weissman, who is the head federal negotiator from the main table, who has uh, graciously joined us this morning. So she's going to say a few words to you. I just want to make sure everybody has everything they need, name tags, name badges, everything spelt correctly. Um, I don't have a badge. Okay. Oh, you don't have a badge. Oh, yes, I know. Sorry. Oh. What, restrooms? restrooms? Protocol for restrooms. Uh, you go whenever you need to. Um, <laughs> and uh, there, I forget where, the, where are they, Anne Marie? You know, I'm, right outside the hall. Right outside. Men's are the left. Yeah, men's to the left, women's to the right. When you go around. And you have to ask me for a hall pass first? No. Just... Good morning, everyone. My name is Anne Marie Weissman. I'm the federal negotiator for the full committee, and I'm dropping in on all of the subcommittees. So pardon my uh, tardiness. <laughs> I wanted to get here when you started, but I was upstairs meeting with the other two groups briefly. I'll be dropping in and out of each of the subgroup meetings so that I can get a flavor of what you're talking about. I will get a full rundown at the end of each day from Greg and the other subcommittee leaders, but I just wanted to make sure I had a chance to thank you all for being with us for the hard work that you're about to do and to let you know how much we appreciate it. And we think that you'll be able to kind of hash out some of the details here to assist the full committee in doing its work and to let you know again that this is something new for us to have three simultaneous subcommittees. So we are experimenting a bit and we appreciate you helping us and guiding us through that. And if you have feedback at the end to let us know how you felt it worked, we would appreciate hearing from you. So thanks again. And again, I'll be in and out, but um, happy to meet with you and talk with you if you have things that I can help you with, especially regarding how the full committee is working and how your work here will be brought back to them um, so we'll, we'll be in touch, uh, throughout this meeting and the other two as well. Thank you. Thank you, Emory. And, uh, you can stay with us for a while or are you? Okay. All right. Um, so Emory's going to remain with us for a little bit. Uh, and so what we'll do is, uh, I'll turn it over to Beth and she can, uh, she can start with, uh, 600 and 602. Greg. I'm sorry. I, yes. Uh, sign. Uh, Mr. Anderson. Thanks. Uh, Rob Anderson, SHEO. Uh, good to see you again, Anne-Marie. Um, I, I know one of the issues that, that came up in the main committee meeting was j just having the subcommittee streamed and not having a, a, a presence of individuals. And, you know, the, of course, there wasn't space for this time around, but I was wondering if that was going to be considered for future subcommittee meetings, if there was going to be any uh, change of venue, perhaps. So because we published this in the Federal Register and we have to give so many days notice for public meetings, um, this is actually not considered a public meeting because you are not a decision-making body. Uh, the, the compromise that we settled on was to do the live streaming of them. So that would not change for this session of negotiated rulemaking. And when I say this session, it's really the session, so this through March. So it won't change where you need to report or what you are doing or how we're structuring here. Uh, because we said that it would be live streamed up front, we felt that we needed to honor that commitment. We can certainly look to the future as to whether it's helpful to have them live streamed, if it's more helpful to have the public present. Um, I think that we wanted to keep these more smaller, more intimate gatherings. It's not that we're not looking for public feedback, but I think that these are more kind of working groups. And because all of the decisions are being made in the full committee, that's where the voting is occurring, we'll be discussing each of these issues that you talk about here and any recommendations that you make in that full committee. So um, I think that our, our goal is to kind of balance all of our objectives and uh, it won't result in changes for the schedule that we have now through March. Thanks. Sorry, Amanda. Thank you. I just wanted for best practices because of like questions and we're all the way at the back that we would, if we have a question, put our placard up just so you can see. So, and in order, if that's possible. Yeah, we, will, uh, we will do that. As I Thank said before, um, well, when we have Tony, Tony, Tony will, will be directing who, uh, who's acknowledged. So uh, that, that will, we'll have a protocol similar to what they have at the, uh, at the main table. So you can just raise your tent and be, and be acknowledged. 
I, hopefully he'll be, my eyesight is not, not that good. I wear different glasses to drive, so don't worry, but um, uh, when I'm, I, I have like four pairs of glasses. I know I need progressives and I, I refuse to get them out of vanity. So, um, you know, I can't, you're right, I, it doesn't matter. I, so anyway, if I don't see your sign, I'm, I'm gonna try until, when, when Tony's up, when Tony's um, here, up here, he'll, he'll have better vision, I think. I just proved my point. Actually, uh, yeah, turn your, uh, that's uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Fast, Carolyn Fast. Hi, just a, just a quick question about uh, an agenda. You mentioned that there was some kind of agenda that was going to be discussed. Yeah, we do have, we do have an agenda. Uh, we have one formal agenda, and then we have another one that will indicate to you who, which, whether it's David or, or, uh, or me who will be speaking. I'll make sure I hand that out. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Beth now. Good morning, everyone. As uh, Greg has mentioned, my name is Elizabeth Daggett. I'm with the Accreditation Group. Um, I've been asked to go over the, I believe, seven definitions uh, with some edits in Part 602 under Accreditation, as well as one specific one that's in Part 600 definitions. So I thought we would tackle... Um, the ones in 602 first. So if you go to section 602.3. Could we just wait a sec till everyone yep. is like settled? Okay. Hi again. And everybody has an agenda. Um, are there any other questions, or is everybody settled? Got everybody settled? Okay. Good. Just one thing, Sorry Beth. Before you start, Beth, um, the agenda you got is a main agenda. We are getting one copy. There'll be more. It's more uh, detailed to what we'll be doing actually here. So you get. An, uh, we're getting that copy now. So um, if we could, I think that the request was to go ahead and do the accreditation dis, um, definitions first. Those are located in section 602.3, most of the ones that I'll be discussing. Um, if you look at the beginning of that part, the reason um, there's some changes to decisions um, de to the definitions is that many of the ones that were included in 602 overlapped with those that were included in 600, and so there was a move to kind of have our definitions all in one place instead of referencing the same definition in multiple places. So that's why there's that list right at the beginning that says that these definitions are contained in section 600, um, CFR part 600. The first definition where there was a real change to the language is the one listed as compliance report. It's on page the top of page two. And the change, I'll go ahead and read it, um, each definition. 
Compliance report means a written report that the department requires an agency to file when that agency is found to be out of compliance to demonstrate that the agency has addressed deficiencies specified in a decision letter from the senior department official or the secretary. It continues to say compliance reports must be approved in order for the agency's recognition to be granted or continued. Compliance reports must be reviewed by the department and the advisory committee and approved by the senior department official to continue to grant or to continue or grant in the case of an award of initial of an initial award the agency's recognition. And the reason for the change in this definition was to make it more clear that a compliance report is when an agency is found to be um, out of compliance with particular regulations regarding their recognition versus, as you'll see later, we added a definition for what's called a monitoring report. Um, so there, these changes were made to provide a differentiation between those two reports as well as to reflect um, the common practice of the use of the compliance report. Are there any comments? Right. Jessica. Thank you. I guess I just want to voice a concern that I know was raised in the main committee that we're starting here with just diving into really technical red lines language without any bird's eye view. And I guess it would be really helpful for me to have some sort of framing discussion for where we're going this morning and what the overarching principles are here that are driving this red line changes other than their definitions, because this actually seems like somewhat of a substantive change if I understand what you're saying, but I just, some background would be helpful. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to try to fi provide whatever background that I can. Um, I don't actually believe that the changes here demonstrate a, a substantive change. We currently have compliance reports and use them with accrediting agencies. When an agency were to fail to uh, meet our requirements, the options that are available to, to the department, um, thank you. Uh, to the department include um, either granting recognition either on an initial basis or re-recognition, asking for a compliance report of up to a year to provide that report to demonstrate compliance or some sort of limitation, suspension, or termination of the agency's recognition. Um, what the overall goals of some of the other, I know the main committee is discussing the accreditation issues, but some of the other goals in particular to this area is to provide more flexibility for an agency that perhaps is not necessarily out of compliance with the regulation, um, but then not providing only having a termination or compliance report as the option. So the clarifying language here is that the compliance report is used when an agency is out of compliance with the regulation versus the monitoring report language, which you'd see later, is used more for um, they haven't uh, an agency perhaps hasn't had the opportunity to demonstrate compliance in a certain area, or they have policies that perhaps need, need a minor revision or some other area. Anne Marie, thank you. So I, I think from what I heard you were asking for might have been a more higher level overview of the goals of kind of where we're going with this rulemaking overall. So if, if that's not what you're looking for, feel free to flag me and stop me and I'll just be quiet and listen. Um, is, it was Jessica, correct? Is that what you were looking for more broadly about kind of what our plan is? Go ahead. I guess I think there's two things. I think there's the the bird's eye view of where this, the overview of this rulemaking, which you're saying, and then I think the second one is, um, it sounds to me like someone at the table has an idea of what we're going to talk through this morning, and I think that would be helpful mm -hmm. to share out. I don't and how that piece fits into the broader project that you're doing. I just I feel like starting with this definition is is. Um, one piece, tiny piece of a very big puzzle, and just maybe to give us some context would be helpful. Thank you. Sure, I, I can do some of that, and I think that Greg can probably do the second piece. As many of you know, the, the theme of our rulemaking overall is accreditation and innovation. So it's, it's handling those issues as well as some others. As we've talked earlier, we have three simultaneous subcommittee meetings that are going on. And we're handling in those, this is one of them, of course, distance education and innovation, 
We'll touch on some accreditation issues here as well, particularly the definitions. We also have the faith-based subcommittee meeting talking about faith-based institutions, particularly related to grant programs as well as some other issues. <coughs> and then the third one is related to the TEACH grant where they're talking about some operational issues, especially related to the conversion of TEACH grants to loans and how we can reverse erroneous conversions. Um, that application process, what that would look like, some of those details. So the subcommittees, of course, will report back at each of the next two full rulemaking sessions. Our overall theme is really innovation, trying to look at how our regulations and in some cases might impede that. Uh, so things that we might be able to take out of our current regulations, things that we might be able to modify in our current regulations, or in some cases areas where we might need to regulate in a way that uh, provides for more innovation. So that's the theme, and I would say that related to accreditation more specifically, we're looking at a couple of areas. One of them is credit transfer, the discussion of regional versus national accrediting agencies and how they may or may not accept credits from each other. Another area that we're looking at, again, related to that innovation theme is the idea of is the way the current accrediting agency structure is set up, is that leading to an anti-competitiveness? Is there difficulty if you are a new accrediting agency who wants to form? Is there difficulty that would impede you from doing that? Um, and then the third area I would say we really want to stress is the idea of regulations being one size fits all, the work that accrediting agencies doing, as a one-size-fits-all model and trying to move away from that and move to a more, um, in some cases it would be a risk-based model, in other cases it might be a, um, a look at how accrediting agencies might give different have different standards for different types of institutions or different sizes of institutions. Right now, if we have an institution where there are 300 people at the institution, the rules are the same under most accrediting agency standards as it would be for a school of 30,000. And having worked at a small school previously, I can tell you that's very challenging uh, when you don't necessarily have the resources of a large institution. So it not, it's not to say that you're going to have lower standards. We want to ensure that the quality is still there, that we still have guardrails to provide protections for students, but that we want to make sure that it's reasonable that we can have a sense of reasonableness around regulations. We don't want to make them weaker. Um, we don't want to make them easier. We want to have rigor and we want to emphasize quality, but we also have to look at who is best within the triad to do that and how we can all work together to serve students because that's why we're here. So I hope that gives you the brief high level overview that might be helpful. If you have follow up questions, again, I'd be happy to answer them. I believe the agenda that you had discussed is coming around now, so you should have that, and that will list the more individualized topics. And again, Greg may be able to speak to that part of the structure a little bit more, but happy to answer other questions. Um, I know that many of you, this might be your first experience with rulemaking. <coughs> and so in the main committee, we kind of had what I think of as Neg Reg School. We had a, a brief slideshow, and we could certainly share that with you if that would be helpful in terms of how the main committee is operating. and. Um, It'll be posted to our website shortly as well. The facilitators that we have there for the larger group uh, developed it, and I think it's very useful. Russell. Uh, thank you, Russ Poulin with WCET. And I, I guess I have an um, observation about this process, and I was curious what other others thought, and uh, maybe a question for you all is that, is that this is the Distance Learning and Education Innovation Subcommittee. And I'm trying to figure out, and, and I'm looking around the, the table, and I'm, uh, we have one person representing accreditation. Uh, I think all of us have had things to do with accreditation, but we're much more, uh, tend to be much more on the innovation, distance learning, competency-based education, uh, the way it was set up. So 
is this committee, uh, well, for, first of all, I feel this committee is a bit ill-equipped to handle accreditation issues at large, or I'll speak for myself, I won't speak for everyone else, uh, and wondered, are we looking at, is this charge to this committee to look at all the accreditation issues or the accreditation issues that that have an impact on more on the innovation side? I was trying to figure that out. Greg? Yeah, I mean, part of the problem here, as you probably know, is that we're looking at we're looking a lot at 600, which is a lot to do with what, what, what the issues you talked about that you've all been chosen to be here for. Uh, there are definitions that over, and we're dealing with all those definitions, and there are definitions that overlap with the with accreditation and with us. So I, I think because we're looking at those definitions, we've been tasked with discussing the, these overlapping definitions. I don't think it is our, our, our goal or, or here to debate at length um, changes to accreditation. That's occurring at the main table. So what I'd like to do is, is Beth's, um, Beth is going to go over these with us, I, and, I, and I agree. I don't think we should spend as much time or as much effort on, on these as we're going to with the other items that we're, we've been tasked to really delve into. So I'd I'm not saying to brush these off or don't consider them. Beth's going to go through them. Uh, we have her expertise here. Where you have, if you have a comment about them, uh, Please, please make it. Um, if you don't have a comment about it, then you don't have a comment about it, and we'll we'll take all those comments. And if we that we have, if if nobody has anything to say about it, we'll we'll move on. If the report back to the committee is that we didn't have any um, any, any discussion about that particular item, I'm I'm fine with that. But we're just going to give everybody an opportunity to go through it. I don't think you need to worry about it if you're not an expert in accreditation. I certainly am not. I'm I'm like you. My expertise is with the, with, with a lot of this other these other. Uh, Items the same with with Mr. Musser. That's why we have Beth here. So we're just going to go through them. And I would ask any of you, if you have expertise in that area, or want to make a comment or have a question, ask it. But do not feel as if we have to. You have to force conversation out of yourself that you don't. You don't really want to have about a given topic. Russell, do you have any reply? Well, well, I really like what you said about uh, maybe going going through these things and looking at them and maybe come back to them because as we get into the detail issues that I thought were going to be on this committee that a lot of them rely on accreditation and so uh, and so I can see where we need to look at those and perhaps we need to review them now and come back to them later and then look at it. That seems like that would be a good point because uh, we probably won't be able to prove some of the other things unless we have a better idea of the accreditation. So I do like that part of the conversation. So thank you, Greg. My pleasure. Jillian, then Jessica. Yeah, I would just, to your comment, Russ, I um, would just add on the full committee, there definitely is um, a lot of accreditation representation and I think really thoughtful people there. So, and Leah's here, which is great. So I, you know, I think this committee should feel um, interested in talking through these and to your point, seeing sort of how they dovetail with distance education, but also know that the full committee, um, I expect based on how it went earlier this week, we'll have really fulsome conversations also about these topics, um, regardless of if we spend five days here talking about it or five minutes, so. Just my perspective. Uh, given this conversation, I was hoping we could either ask Jillian or ask someone to come with Jillian when she reports out to the main committee that notwithstanding the fact that we're talking a lot about accreditation, we feel somewhat uncomfortable with our own expertise and our recommendations should be taken lightly or so. I don't, I don't know exactly how to phrase that, but I, I wouldn't want, given this conversation, what we to talk about these to be misunderstood by the members of the main committee is possibly more authoritative. Gregory. Uh, yeah, I don't know that I want to use the words <laughs> taken lightly. Um, I never want to be taken lightly. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I, I think we can, uh, yeah, what you're saying that, you know, we that we didn't feel, we can say we didn't feel that uh, if, that's, if that's the consensus of the group that we didn't feel we had enough expertise here in that area to, to really go into depth in, in addressing that, then, then we certainly can conclude that. If that's, if that's the way, after we talk about these, the majority of you feel, and we can just report out what we have. If we don't have a lot to report on those issues, we don't have a lot to report. Um, I'm, I'm okay with that, I, and I think Anne-Marie's okay with that as well. Um, I don't think that would work for some of the other things we were supposed to go into more detail on. Uh, we just decided not to talk about it. But, um, but yeah, I think it for, for accreditation, certainly. But we're going to give everybody the opportunity to address those items. Okay. Um, Anne-Marie and then Mary. 
I, I appreciate what you're saying. And again, because I'll be at all of the full committee meetings, I, I hear your concern and I don't want anybody to feel pressured. If, if you have a particular area where you just feel you want to say, look, pass back to the full committee, it goes. I mean, if, if that's what we need to do, we're prepared to do that. But again, I think we tried to group the areas in a way that we thought made sense. If we didn't get it quite right, you can feel free to say, look, we think this one needs a lot more discussion in the full committee versus, you know, we had great discussion on this issue and we've got recommendations. Again, you, you may have a recommendation that you say, we think the full committee should do this. Or you may say, we can't decide. Half of us think this and half of us think that. It's, it's your subcommittee, so we want you to feel free to do what you feel is best. We want to give you some flexibility but we hope that you'll at least attempt each of the conversations and, and do your best. But we understand, and it's the same on the full committee. There are people who say, there are some issues where I feel a lot stronger about and, and have a lot more to say and have a lot more background. So do your best and again, give us that feedback. Let us know how we can help you. I'm gonna make a quick comment and a reflection of that. It's, it's sort of, to me, it just appears that we've been asked to cast a net and sometimes when you pull up the net, you have some extra things that you weren't really thinking that you were going to go after. So you decide whether or not you're going to keep it on the ship or you're going to dump it off, it, right? So, you know, we'll make those decisions, I guess, through our conversations. And I'm sure that whatever we come up with, that the full committee will be very satisfied in what we try to report on because we're putting forth a great effort. That's about it. And Meredith, it's... I would concur with what's been said and just say we don't put accreditation under one fail swoop because I think there's some parts in here that we're going to have strong feelings towards and be quite knowledgeable about. So I, I think it's wise to be able to say for the areas, but to break it down and not umbrella at all under accreditation. Thank you. Beth? I'm sorry. Leah, you had it up and then you brought it down and you brought it up again. <laughs> I'm um, just along the lines of Meredy and some of the other comments. Um, I'm intimately familiar with these rules as an organization that applies them every day. Um, some areas are just going to be administrative, technical, procedural things accreditors do to go through recognition <laughs> that I just don't think that this group needs to engage on. But there are some very important sections, as Meredy said, that overlap with the other conversations taking place, the definition for distance education, regular and substantive interaction, um, you know, direct assessment, competency-based correspondence, and that's why we're here, to, to talk about those areas and inform the conversation about accreditation and what accreditation needs to do to be more effective in um, reviewing distance ed programs. Marty, you still have your card up? All right. Thank you, Leah. Um, and thanks to all the other comments. I think that it's very important um, obviously that all of these are discussed and I think the reason that um, I was asked to come forward is to give um, an overview of the changes to the specific accreditation definitions and be able and I will be here to be able to provide support as you're talking through other areas that it may address those um, but that these need to be discussed at some point um, so I think what I'll do is as Greg had talked about is I'll go through the definitions if any of the specific ones there are not all of the ones that necessarily are of specific interest of everybody on this subcommittee I'm going to go through those at this point if you have any overall questions or comments about those seven then we can talk about those, but I'll be here as a resource, and this is kind of to set some understanding of some of the background, I think, that was discussed by Jessica um, and, and Jillian of some of the issues that are um, brought up in the accreditation area that are being talked about at the main committee. So, um, so I, I went through the compliance report one. I know that that's a very technical area with regards to the recognition process of agencies. Um, if you'd like, I can get list what the other ones were th um, that I was going to read through. The, um, the next one is the final accrediting action. It's in the middle of page three.
Um, the change to that was to the second sentence. So, right, it's final accrediting action means a final determination by an accrediting agency regarding the accreditation or pre-accreditation status for an institution or program. A final accrediting action is the decision made by the agency, including at the conclusion of any appeals made available to the institution or or program by the agency's due process policies and procedures. And the reason this was put in is that it wasn't clear if the requirement to report uh, a final accrediting action meant prior to the appeals or afterward, and this is to clarify um, what that expectation was. Russell? Did you skip over direct assessment for a reason? Yes, because okay. those are the ones that have been moved to 600. So I was only doing the one. Oh, I'm so, yes. Well, that one is um, going to be talked about specifically under direct assess um, direct assessment programs by David Musser. He's going to talk about all of that all together. I'm sorry. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, no, he was gonna. He's got the whole direct assessment part. So thank you. Um, the next. Uh, definition after that was going to, is monitoring report. This is a new definition that's added to the accreditation section. Um, as I talked about before, this is to differentiate, um, have a different type level of report versus the compliance report, which is a definite out of compliance with a specific regulation. Monitoring report means a report that an agency is required to submit to the department containing documentation that the agency is, one, implementing its current or corrective policies, two, compliance in practice but needs to provide additional documentation, or three, compliant in practice but needs to update its policies to conform with its practice. So it's a lower, it would be considered a lower level of report than a compliance report and would not be, um, as it's noted here, it would, it would be submitted to the department but wouldn't be required to go through the full review by the advisory committee um, because it wasn't a, a, a actual um, finding of non-compliance. The next one with um, an edit is programmatic accrediting agency. Um, minor edits here means an agency that accredits specific educational programs including those that prepare students in specific academic disciplines or for entry into a profession, occupation, or vocation. It's more to clarify and reflect what um, the programmatic accrediting agencies that we accredit already do. Um, there was a minor addition to um, the recognition definition, but we felt like that was more of a technical change and to reflect um, our uh, current practice as um, that the agency has to be effective and consistent in its application of the criteria. Jillian. Sorry to take us back. Um, okay. I wasn't clear if you wanted to comment sort of at the end of walking through the definitions uh, or if you want as we go. I was protocols. kind of waiting a little <laughs> bit in between to see if there were, so I'm totally open. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, just to go back to final accrediting action, um, I'm wondering if it's intentional that it should that uh, including still be in there? I'm trying to understand when a final accrediting action would happen that's not at the conclusion of appeals. Um, um, if, an, if, an, if a program or institution were to not elect to go through the appeals process. Okay. Okay. The problem is, is that agencies, it hasn't been clear because they'll do a what's considered an accreditation decision at a point when they make a determination regarding um, a pro, an institution or program, whether that's to accredit or not accredit or some other decision in between. Um, when they do take some sort of adverse action or actually any action they determine to be appealable under their policies, it wasn't clear whether the department was expecting the notification at the time of when that action was taken or at the time at the end of the availability to appeal. And what had been found is that there are times that um, an agency would notice that they have made a final determination of perhaps a termination, but then that um, institutional program had appealed that and the appeals panel had either uh, remanded 
back to the original decision making or made a um, decision to overturn it. And that program or institution would then have conflicting information of whether or not they had lost their accreditation or whether or not they are currently accredited and it was not clear to the public. So we were trying to make it clear that it's once that decision um, was made was at its final form and there was no further appeal rights. Mm -hmm. It almost reads like uh, an accrediting agency could issue the final accrediting action before um, or not allow an institution to appeal. I'm not sure if that would ever happen, but because of the word including, it's a little bit. Okay, I can take confusing. that back, not a problem. Okay, thanks. Caroline. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I also had a comment about the word including, and I was a little confused about um, if uh, your response about um, what this means, because um, if the issue is and maybe I'm misunderstanding the issue, but is the issue that the um, that it, it, the, it's unclear when it needs to be reported to the department by by a school that has no by an accrediting agency? Okay, so so it, it seems to me that that's still a little confusing because the the accrediting agency would have to know whether um, the um, there was going to be an appeal, or else they would have to wait till the end of the appeals process. So, it could, so in other words, I, I'm also confused about the word including, and if it means, if, you're, if we're trying to say at in, in the end of the appeal or after the institute has decided not to appeal, then maybe that's what it should say, if that's what that meant. Okay. I can take that back. Perhaps if we just struck the word including, that might make it more clear. Okay. Are there any other comments or about though that one or the others? I was going to move then to scope of recognition, where we have added um, a line to that definition. So we're on page four in the middle. So the scope of recognition is the scope with which the department recognizes an agency. So if an agency only re only um, accredits four-year institutions, um, then they would have to ask for something additional if they wanted to add graduate programs at a certain level. Um, so that what this is talking about is what we define as the scope. And so there's only the change made to um, the geographic area of activities to provide um, a provi to provide more guidance in that the um, the geographic, the scope of recognition or scope means the range of accrediting agencies for which the secretary recognizes an agency. The secretary may place a limitation on the scope of an agency's recognition for Title IV HEA purposes. The secretary's designation of scope defines the recognition granted according to the geographic area of accrediting agencies and the addition of this line of such that the inclusion of a particular geographic area in one's acc one accreditor's scope does not preclude the inclusion of that same or similar geographic area in another accreditor's scope. So it's saying that if a certain, if there's currently a st state agency that a regional could include that state or if there was a regional who wanted to have overlapping states with another regional accreditor that they could do that and making that more clear that that's not a prohibited practice. It's never been prohibited but it's more making it more clear in the regulation. Jody. Yeah, I just wonder if you could speak a little bit more to what the underlying purpose of this provision is? Um, I believe that um, the department's position was to encourage uh, competition and encourage um, access. Um, I guess my question is then, what? Um, it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that perhaps that would potentially lead to a situation in which you could have a sort of race to the bottom situation. Are there any protections to prevent that type of situation? I, I mean, I, I didn't envision that the d d discussion of a geographic area would encourage a race to the bottom. Well, if you're giving, for example, institutions that in, if you approve a regional accreditor that has um, a same state as another regional accreditor, could you end up in a situation then where you have um, 
you know, an institution in that particular state has a choice to go to the easier, the accreditor that's perceived to go easier on institutions? Um, I wouldn't necessarily characterize it that way. I would characterize it as that they have more opportunity to um, have a different uh, accreditor versus um, having no choice whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, there are an, if there are a national accrediting agency, then they could already move from accrediting agency to accrediting agency. Right, that's true. I'm talking about the situation involving regionals, though. So it's just an observation. I think that that's. I don't think to that be... any of the regionals would think that they're at the bottom. <laughs> not, not the current. One. I'm assuming I'm talking about if you allow um, new regionals to compete with the existing regionals, which is your stated objective. David? Yeah, uh, maybe a little more pejoratively stated, uh, it does seem like it would encourage uh, uh, um, shopping around. Um, and uh, so it may not be a race to the bottom, but um, I would be hard pressed to imagine an institution that's looking for accreditation not to shop around to see where it gets the best deal. Already? I think similarly, I'm just trying to clarify, since, as I understand it, this is already allowed and it seems to apply more to the national accreditors, this is trying to clarify that it could be done at the regional accrediting agencies? I think it's just trying to clarify that it can be done. It's not focused at any particular agency. I mean, institutions can already move between regional accreditors. I mean, if, especially if you're distant said, you just move your headquarters and you can, you know, set yourself up in a different regional accreditor. I guess my interpretation of this is perhaps a regional accreditor wants to expand beyond California and Hawaii or, you know, beyond New England. I, I mean, I don't know what that does for students. I mean, if we're going to be focused on how we're advancing opportunities and protecting student interests, I, I don't know what this does. Um, but, uh, Maybe the experts on the main committee can, you know, maybe give this more attention. We can share with them some of our thoughts about well, what does this mean for, for students um, as we kind of move in this direction with this language. Meredith, you still have yeah. a comment? Yeah, I, I would propose that um, that we share with the main committee that. My thought is this actually makes it more confusing, and accreditation is already confusing enough to the average student. I, I would suggest that state institutions cannot pick up and shop um, which regional uh, state we want to be located in. So I would just propose we push it back to the main committee for serious consideration that it does not add clarity and could, could in fact, lead to more um, shopping to meet your needs. Okay. Wise Carpenter once said measure Twice, cut once. <laughs> Gregory? Uh, yeah, it, so you, uh, Mary, you're proposing that we, uh, did you want to take uh, um, take the pulse of the group to see if they're, how they feel about that? Uh, okay, I think we, I think we entertain that then uh, to see, uh, using the, uh, using the thumbs method. Uh, I was trying to think of an, another way, but of course I couldn't come up with any, so we're using the thumbs method. Um, so uh, why don't uh, those me, of you Greg. who uh, who uh, do you want to restate that just again, Meredy, and then we'll have a we'll ha oh okay. do we have one yeah, we have a man first. In first? Okay. Yeah. thank you. We'll get all the comments first and then do that. I just had a question for Beth. What was there any discussion or um, Marianne? Um, was there a discussion when discussing like this goal or your objective was to create, you know, encourage accreditors to cross lines, unintended consequences for students and how um, you're looking at it really, what the discussion was is looking at it from a perspective of, you know, accreditors, but was there discussion of possible unintended consequences for students who are then um, given more options and what the prices would be, how they would market that, just looking ahead in the future and whether it's a good objective overall for students since that's what you're saying we're here for? So in, 
I was not in all of the discussions related to all of the issues, but in the discussions that I was present for, the discussion surrounding the possible impact on students was that we thought that the competitiveness that it would bring would actually be beneficial for students, that in some cases it could lower the price for accreditation for an institution. Um, the thought here was part of that big versus small discussion that we had earlier that some accrediting agencies might end up specializing in areas that they hadn't specialized in previously. So if you have an institution where you have 300 students and that's your entire school, uh, when, when you have a large accrediting agency that's looking at, um, I, this is a very dated example and I apologize, but years ago when I was still at a school, they were asking us, well, how many volumes do you have in your institution's library? And we were a very focused institution with a single mission, um, two programs that were focused on the same discipline. And we didn't need to have the large library that a main university would have. But when we were looking at changing accreditors, the one that we were looking at wanted us to have the same number that the large university down the street had. And we couldn't compete. That just wasn't that wasn't the same type of thing. Now, I realize volumes in the library in the digital age is not the critical issue anymore, and I'm sure there's a comparable issue that isn't coming to my mind, but um, that was one of the examples that was kind of kicked around. The idea that when you have multiple opportunities for an institution to go to, it might yield a new accrediting agency that has a newer mission and focuses more on smaller schools and trying to meet their accreditation needs. And then, and in turn, it would focus on the needs of those students in a better way and that they would have their interest in mind with the idea of looking at resources that were reasonable for that smaller sized institution versus a large complex research university that would have a lot more to offer. But the, the students who are attending those two different institutions, when they're choosing those institutions, they're choosing them based on the idea of they know what they're looking for. So I'm not going to go to a school that offers uh, a program or two programs and maybe has 500 students expecting the same resources that you would have. I wouldn't expect there, for example, to be a large health center. Whereas where I went to university, uh, it was a large public state university, there was basically like a mini hospital on campus. You're not going to have the same kinds of things for students, but when I picked that school, I knew where I was going versus other students are going to pick a smaller school and say maybe they're going to use the resources in their town versus something on campus. And I think it was just trying to be mindful of those kinds of decisions that people are making and with the hope that it would end up being better for the institutions and the students. I mean, does that help? Okay. Uh, David? Just uh, one other, um, I think, likely consequence. So if we imagine that um, now institutions can pick and choose where they are accredited or by which institution, you're likely to start to see a, uh, a, a hierarchy among the accreditors uh, where some are going to be seen as more difficult, which will be more desirable for the more elite institutions. And so you might start to get kind of an accreditation hierarchy in that regard. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but I think it is a likely consequence that needs to be considered. Uh, Jessica? Thank you. Uh, I see students every day in my practice who are really suffering from schools that didn't do the right thing for them, and I just want to articulate. It's it's a little bit hard to talk about the last few years in this space without naming particular schools, but you can imagine some of the schools they may have attended that are no longer operating. Um, and so I just want to reiterate that obviously the consumer protection goal is really important, especially for low-income students. And I think that in um, obviously, you know, there. Are, I, I guess I would be curious of Ed's position about, you know, one of the consequences of this opening a sort of race to the bottom of accreditors or institutions that aren't serving students well, being able to switch accreditors in a way that ultimately doesn't serve the students. Beth, did... No, I just wanted to provide a comment that this um, actual addition of this language would not change the current allowance within the regulation. This just puts into words that this is possible and things that perhaps people thought weren't possible were. So there was, there's no, this doesn't change how the regulation, um, could, an, an agency could extend their boundaries today. Um, and we 
would look at that. It's allowable. Meredith. It's my understanding that the goal of the overall committee is to look at the red line document but is not constrained by the red line document. So if we decide on input to advise them, I want to clarify that it's not necessarily saying we do or don't support the red line. It's that we may have input that we think would help clarify it or changes even that we think may we may want to see that are different than those proposed. Is that accurate? Yes. So that may add round two of comments. David. Just very briefly, so uh, from a student protection perspective, I think the other issue here is that <coughs> students do not understand accreditation at all. They just look for the word, right? So, um, so as long as an institution is accredited, as far as a student's concerned, that's cool because I can get aid. So I don't think that, um, well, I, I, I would worry that uh, a hierarchy of accreditors, we already have it, uh, but even a greater hierarchy of accreditors might pose bigger risks to students. Meredy, oh, okay. Gregory, did you want to see? Oh, I'm sorry, Anne Marie. I just, I think that Meredy brought up a very important process point, and again, because I wasn't here for the very beginning of your discussion, I don't know if this was covered, but I, I think in light of her comment, I think it's worth emphasizing. What we have in the red lines were seen as a starting point or a proposal. Uh, it's a little different than what we've typically done in negotiated rulemaking and that we typically bring you an issue paper with questions and things that are supposed to spark discussion. Uh, we, because of the volume of what we're covering this time, decided to bring opening language, but it's still a discussion point. It's a starting point. And we see what we're doing as negotiations, true negotiations, where we don't expect this to be what leaves the room or what leaves the full committee room. We expect this to spark your discussion and that you'll have ideas that we didn't think of, that the idea of the group being you know, greater than the parts. So we don't want you to think that we brought you here so you can say, yes, this looks good. We want to recommend it. We brought you here so that you'll make recommendations for changes and that you'll see things that we didn't see. And it may be that it's something that's not redlined that you say, well, I think we want to put this in there. So feel free to use this as that starting point that we intended it to be and, and not to be so constrained by thinking we're expecting you to just come to the point of saying yes to all. Um, it's, it's not an accept all changes kind of discussion. It really is to hear what you think. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you for that clarification, Anne Marie, because I feel I've been sitting at the negotiations for the past three days. So, or two, I'm sorry, it feels like three days, one and a half days. Uh, and I feel like, you know, I'm jumping in obviously much further along than the rest of you. And so I apologize for doing that. My goal here really is um, exactly what, um, you know, Anne Marie and Greg have said is to kind of provide the um, the changes that have been proposed and then also provide the rationale for that and be able to answer the questions that you might have. Um, so I just, um, you know, if I, I'm appreciative of, you know, the feedback and the language because we will be bringing that all back to the main committee. So are there any other further questions on this particular one at this particular time, knowing that you can always come back to things um, as you want? Jillian. Yeah, I would just add, um, and I'll write a note to myself to take back to the full committee, that um, for sure Barbara and other representatives of regional accreditation need to weigh in on this as well, since that voice is not at this table, um, to make sure that we're accounting for that also. Carolyn, did you want to make a comment? Um, I... Microphone. Sorry. Um, I just wasn't uh, totally clear on what we were reporting back on this point. Um, I think that Meredith was going to make a proposal and then we never got to it because we were having <laughs> some more helpful discussion, but did, did, did you still want to make a proposal? And I was trying to listen to more of the discussion to see if it changed it, but I, I don't think it really did. Just more that I do think we, we bring this back to the main um, committee as a point that we had active discussion on it and voice concerns about downstream um, ramifications, whether it's allowed now or not, or whether it's allowed now or just clarified that we had concerns on downstream ramifications of this potential overlap and shopping, accreditor shopping. Gregory. 
Uh, yeah, just on that note, I just like to, if we are prepared uh, to, to take a, uh, the pulse of the of the committee on what Mary just said, uh, as expre um, expressing those um, concerns to the main committee. And again, uh, if if others have differing opinions, we, we, we will certainly take that. We'll go back to the committee as well, saying you know the ma majority uh, felt this way, but there were well, there was dissent. So let me just uh, by show of a uh, thumbs, how many want to put in their report our report back uh, what those reservations that Meredith just discussed. That looks like everybody. Oh, I'm sorry. I put my glasses on. <laughs> All right, so it looks like we have one that was decided, so that means you can live with it, if not fully endorsing. Does anybody want to express any um, any dissenting view from what Meredith talked about so that we would include that as well if it exists? Because I, I don't want to choke off anybody who has it. I know it's sometimes just difficult to be in the minority, you know. You feel like, I don't want to say it because everybody else felt a different way, but I want to encourage you and anybody here to, to express those opinions, even if you're the only one. Okay, then I think uh, I'll Amanda. I think it would be important to highlight that we really took a discussion on unintended consequences and really how that would affect students. Um, and that there was really no, in my question, I think I was also hoping to hear some data to back some of the objectives, which I can understand may be difficult to have data or some type of backing of evidence but just that you know it was mostly a discussion there was no true like evidence to back up like lower cost or where there would be a hierarchy but just that those were some of the options that they would be really thinking about and clarify um, when we're reporting out that what the potential scenarios would be noted Mary just a question um, is there a possibility that the policy would change regardless of the language you're, you're saying it's currently happening now, correct? And this is really just clarifying. And I'm just curious as to if that would happen, if the main committee would recommend that they rethink the entire policy of the ability to choose an accrediting agency. I mean, as the regulation is currently written, they could do the activities that are written in the red line. What the main committee decides to do with that would be up to them. So the committee could make a recommendation to alter that regulation to say something else, but in the absence of it doing that to actually, um, we'd have to all come to consensus, uh, which would include the department's vote, of course. And I don't see that that's the goal of the administration at this point. I think the goal is to encourage the competitiveness and to look toward innovation and that their feeling is that's a good way to do it, uh, to encourage the idea of allowing this flexibility and things like that. So especially given that it already is possible, that there's nothing in the regulation prohibiting it, I, I don't think that's an area where they'd want to go. Um, I, I think they could probably live with not including it, given that the text isn't there now and they're already, you know, accredited schools can already choose their accreditor but I think it would be contrary to the stated goals of the of um, the department to try to strike it or to add something in to say we're not going to allow it. Okay. Jessica. I'd like to bring up, go back to a process point. Is this an okay time to do that? Certainly. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, now that we're getting into this, I'm realizing that our report to the main committee is going to be like pretty detailed and a little bit nuanced. And I just was going to recommend that we maybe decide to have a second person because I, Jillian, I just think it's going to be a lot for you to try and capture sort of all the nuances of these discussions. Jody. Um, if we do decide to have a second person, I just, I am based in DC and I'm attending every day of <laughs> the NAGREG. So I will be in attendance if that helps. Does anyone have any thought about Jody's offer? <laughs> Amanda. I'm also available too. All right. 
Gregory. Uh, yeah, so it seems as if we do have multiple people who'd be willing to go to the to the table. Uh, there's at least two others. So are we as a group okay with that? Anybody? We we could and we could do that. That's Amory just pointed out. We could we could actually decide to split it by issue um, when we when we get moved towards the, having a report. We could divide it up so that all of you don't have to speak uh, to ev one of you doesn't have to speak to every issue. Amory. Yeah, my thought on that was really just that as we look at the the agenda for the subcommittee, there are twenty three distinct issues being discussed, and that's a lot. So so as not to have extra burden on any one of you who volunteered. I, I know that you actually have other work and jobs and school and things like that. So it, it's not to say that either of you are not capable, but just to say that it might be easier if you could meet individually and say, you know, I, I would rather take this issue and divide them up because it, it probably would be a, a significantly large report. And, you know, there's a lot of reading and, and backgrounds and all of that. So I, it's just a suggestion you as a group can decide what works best for you, but sometimes having more people to help with the work is, is better. And, and I know they would welcome your presence and appreciate the hard work that you're doing here too. Marty. Yeah, this is a little bit on an earlier topic. I do think sometimes, even if we don't think it stands a chance of coming to consensus, it's better that we have some things on the record as a discussion in the main group. So I hope we don't back away from things just because we feel that it won't be a consensus getter. Thank you, Gregory. So I, I wanted to just be clear of that we have, there were three individuals, right, uh, that we make. So I'm okay with uh, those three individuals determining which um, which items they'll report out to the to the to the to the main committee. Mm -hmm. If everybody else is, and I don't know that we want to spend a lot of time debating here who should do what. I. I we are, yeah, as long as we have someone to do it, and um, um, I think we can just uh, trust they'll do a, a good job with that. Just one point. Will we see that report before it goes to the full committee? Yes. Ab absolutely. You'll see the report. Okay. Should we continue? Okay. Hearing no further, um, I was going to go ahead and continue. Perhaps we can get through. There are two more in this section, um, and then uh, to get to Greg's break. Um, but we'll see. So the next one that we were going to look at is the senior department official. It's at the bottom of page four. This is really um, just clarifying the current practice, which instead of, so the senior department official is means the senior official in the U.S. Department of Education designated by the secretary to make decisions on accrediting agency recognition. And then the final um, definition in this section that we would cover is the last one at the top of page five, substantial compliance. And this is, again, going towards the addition of that monitoring report that was at a lower level not necessarily indicating um, non-compliance with a regulation. So the substantial compliance definition uh, means having the necessary policies, practices, and standards in place, and in all but a few of those cases adheres with fidelity to those policies, practices, and standards, or having policies, practices, and standards in place that need minor modifications in order to become fully compliant. Jody. Um, in general, definitely supportive of the um, concept of substantial compliance. I was worried about this definition that the first part is a little too loose because, you know, what are we talking about when we say in all but a few of those cases? That language concerns me. I would be perfectly happy with retaining the second part you know, having policies, practices, and standards in place that need minor modifications in order to become fully compliant, because I think that's really what we're talking about. I know we can, I don't know if we can suggest actual language changes to the mm -hmm. language. Yes. So that would be my proposal is to strike the first part of that definition and retain the second. I think the intent of the department in this particular area was to have that um, 
having two options, having the two options. So if we could try to figure out if there was some other language that we might be able to put in place that would more accurately reflect. Um, could you explain? Explain a little bit more what you're trying to capture in the first part that isn't captured in the second. Right. It's that somebody that they have the policies practices in place, but perhaps um, in a couple areas they weren't implemented um, exactly as to the letter of those policies and procedures. So it's giving them the opportunity to provide the documentation that they are full like that they have fully implemented it. It's not saying a systematic issue, which would then be a concern. It's saying that the examples that were provided didn't demonstrate that you've implemented these policies and practices as you state that you did. And so then being able to provide a report that then demonstrates that they've actually implemented as, as written. David? Yeah, so I, I agree about the concern. I think the, the bifurcation of this statement really allows a, a pretty big loophole in the first clause. So um, I wonder if, if you can combine the two and, and say something like um, having the necessary policies and practices and standards in place, understanding that some might need minor modifications in order to become fully compliant or something like that. Yeah. I've um, two comments. So I, I think I understand what you're trying to do here, and I, I think it makes sense. Maybe the language isn't working exactly as a group, but I think what you're saying is if a mistake was made by an institution that is not in line with their policies, that they wouldn't automatically be um, sort of in trouble if it's by happening as a one-off as opposed to like a systematic issue. At the agency level. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, so, um, I think that makes sense. Maybe we can figure out a way to get the language better. Um, my question was going to be, I'm curious if the department has any way to um, get any data around how many instances they think that this would capture that maybe are now, um, since this is a new category, and I don't know the answer to that, but it would be interesting, I think, for us to know what the actual impact would be in terms of um, uh, what the end size would be that we, we would see fall into this new category. Um, it's possible that the accreditation group could go back and look at decisions we've made um, recently um, over the last review period and see if there are any instances that we could point to. I'm not sure if we have that data, but we could try to pull that for yeah, you. Yeah, I think even if it's directional, it would just be useful for us to understand sort of the impact. Thanks. We have a lot of placards up, so Anne-Marie, did you want to say something? Just very quickly, I think that the intent here was more the first half of it being about following institutional, um, following agency policies and the second part was more having the policies. So said in a really, you know, trying to break it up very quickly. It, it, following your own policies is very important, of course. But again, I think the idea was to allow for the one or two off mistakes where you have the policy in place, the policy is compliant, but for some reason you made an exception or you didn't do something in a way that it wasn't documented. We're comfortable with the policy you have. We're just reiterating that you have to follow it in the future. And then that second part was for one or two things, you didn't have that policy in place at all. So that's where we were going with it. It was it was to say that there is overall compliance, but in you know, in a couple of minor cases, something wasn't done that should have been. And and we want to allow kind of a, a different standard for looking back at it in a way that we're keeping tabs on it, that we're we're not just ignoring it and saying, Oh, okay, we'll just say fine, let it go. We want to have a way of of ongoing looking at that going forward. So we have a lot of placards up. So Marity, Leah, Jessica, Russell. So this may, and I may just be overthinking it, but on the second part, I actually was wondering why compliance or adherence was not included in the second S in the second part of this. Because in that case, you didn't have the policy at all. So in the first case, you have the policy, but you didn't follow it. In the second case, the agency didn't have the policy at all that they needed. Okay, I read it that you had policies in place, but they needed minor changes. But it doesn't speak at all to whether or not um, you were consistent. And that appears to be a theme that the <coughs> department's trying to get in here is the consistency in applying 
your policy. So that's, that I would just make a recommendation that maybe they look at adding um, a similar piece that, you know, your fidelity to following, even if they're slightly off your policies. So yes, it's not to say that you didn't have the entire policy, but you didn't have the full policy that you needed. So it needed a modification. But you, I think our theory here is you can't follow something if you don't have it. So we wanted to give you the opportunity to create whatever missing piece there was and then get it in place and then, of course, expect you to follow. But if you feel that there's language we need to add around that, again, you can feel free. This is the time to go ahead and make those suggestions. Leah? Um, I think I understand what this policy is trying to accomplish in, in the greatly complex process of recognizing accreditors. Sometimes you're just missing a conflict of interest document for one of your board members, or, or sometimes, you know, the review of an outside provider with more than 50% of the learning, you, you don't have the application. Sometimes little things do get missed. I think what this is trying to accomplish is, in those instances, it gives accreditation staff and the CQ a, a little bit more flexibility to say, yeah, you have the policy. You have evidence. There was this one place that wasn't done. We're just going to get a follow-up from you on that, and we'll call it a day. I think you can accomplish that by just getting rid of this little bit of troublesome language here and in all but a few of those cases. I think if you strike that language, I think you'll have um, a protocol in place to review accreditors that have their standards and policies in place may need a bit more documentation to make the record complete. Jessica. Thank you. I just wanted to voice an overall goal that I think goes at a higher level to substantial compliance, but also compliance reports, monitoring reports, and some of the definitions we skipped over, which is just that I, I'm a little concerned that these actions wouldn't be publicly available or that, that these definitions may bring actions that are currently publicly available out of the public record. and. I'm by no means an expert in that, but I think having a public record of these is incredibly important to students and, and advocates like me who work with them directly. So I just would like the department to take that in consideration. So these particular, like the monitoring report and compliance report and this um, addition of substantial compliance would be applicable to accrediting agencies in their recognition process. And all of that, um, any of the decisions made by the department would be in the federal, would be on our website as they are available now. Um, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to try to figure out if there's what well, might be a problem. I think I might need to take that back and think about it and then be able to come back. But um, the thought of adding this was not to reduce the transparency, but more to provide greater flexibility. Greg. Uh, well, yeah, I'd like to get um, a sense of the what we just discussed this topic. What we would like to have um, in the report is, is the uh, feelings of the of the of the committee, or, or sort of I hate to use the word consensus because we're not doing consensus here, but the uh, the uh, the temperature of the committee on that. So I know uh, Leah had some language she wanted to do, and Meredy, how I mean, how do um, do we something just to rephrase that? Uh, uh. Scott. I'm going to recognize Scott. Uh, for those uh, that haven't noticed yet, I am trying to make changes as uh, people have recommended them. Uh, so please do take a look. And if you'd like to give me a specific wording on this particular one, uh, we can change it from what I have on the screen currently. Um, or if you just want me to put a note in for us to take it back and uh, think about the things that we've said. I know that there were a couple changes where we at one point had the recommendation of removing the entire first part of the uh, definition and then winnowed it down to just a uh, clause within that. Uh, so if I captured it how you like, also let me know that. I'm going to let people digest what Scott wrote first before I recognize anyone.
Anyone have any further suggestion or comment on what Scott has provided us? Jody? Yeah, sorry, it's hard to talk into the mic and look at the screen. Um, I think um, I thank you for your clarification. I understand now what you were trying to do in that first uh, paragraph. I think what you're trying to say, because you're trying to say um, effectively that minor modifications may be required in order to adhere with your own policies as well as um, adapt your policies to be fully compliant with federal regulations that this doesn't quite do that because the minor modification language isn't modifying both. So I think there's some wordsmithing that needs to happen here, um, right? I mean, Unless at the very end, I, I'm trying to right. maybe adheres with fidelity to existing policies, practices, and standards. I don't know if that points back enough to say, um, I don't know. It's a tough one. Yeah, I agree with what, um, I'm sorry to jump in. Um, I agree with what Jody said in that the point, and, and I think I can't remember who accurately. Maybe I think it was Jillian who said, you know, part one is following the policies, and part two is having the policies. Um, so I think that that was what the intent was, and I agree with Jody. I don't think that as it's written, it um, reflects what the department's intent was to having the substantial compliance. Jody. Sorry, I think it's in, I was asking if we could have come back to this or rather than trying to draft language collectively, maybe come back with some ideas or have the department come back with some ideas because I, I think it's, just, it's, it's specifically the language in all but a few of those cases that we're concerned about and what we really wanna say have is the minor modifications apply to both clauses. Does that make sense? Sally? How about um, we leave it as it is, except saying um, in place of and in all but a few of those say, cases, say with minor exceptions. So it would read means having the necessary policies, practices, and standards in place, and with minor exceptions, adheres with fidelity to those policies, practices, and standards, or having policies, practices, and standards in place that need minor modifications in order to become fully compliant. Jessica. I just, my understanding is this provision is really for the sort of mistakes that you were describing that I think wouldn't have any direct impact on students. And I was wondering if we could think about including that in the definition or something like minor exceptions that don't harm students or I, obviously that's not regulatory language, but something to make clear that the intent of this is, is for like sort of clerical or technical errors. Scott, you're uh, just on the uh, process note, if anybody does have language on any of these definitions uh, between now and the conclusion of all your processes in March, you can always feel free to email those to me. My email address is scott.filter at ed.gov. Leah? Uh, yeah, just in my experience of going through recognition for 20 years, um, you know, these types of things are, are typically administrative, clerical, document keeping types of things. You know, the recognition process isn't going to fly if you have a major policy lapse that truly ties to institutional results that are affecting students. I mean, it just doesn't work like that. So I, I think, you know, if we put in, you know, on administrative basis or, or that kind of thing, maybe that'll um, address any questions for how students are, are protected in the process of recognizing accreditors. But but generally, it, it's it's really just an administrative protocol that they're trying to address here in writing um, to get, allow themselves the ability to do that. Thank you. Gregory, did you want to continue? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> That concludes the discussion for this section. I, I want to thank uh, Beth and Sally for being here with us and sharing their expertise. 
uh, without which we certainly wouldn't have been able to have as robust a discussion as we did. Uh, at this point, I'm going to do what I do best and call for a break. Um, so it is 20... Five to the hour, so we'll take 15 minutes. Uh, please try to be back on a, time, on a timely basis. We do have, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the area, there is across the street from us a, a Starbucks, uh, which I'd appreciate you're not going to because you'll be in line before me. And um, no, just kidding. We also have a, uh, there's a Vie de France uh, out to the right. There's a McDonald's. Um, there's a couple of other sandwich shops. We also have a little uh, commissary type cafeteria in here. Greg, to add to that, for anyone who does leave the building, if you say. make sure you have your badge on you, uh, you will not have to re-sign in. You will still have to go back through security, uh, but it will uh, shorten the process to coming back in. Right. And you don't need to scan food. If you have food or drinks that you're coming back with, I know usually they'll scan people. If you're bringing that in the morning, let the guard know that you have food or beverages and you'd like them just to hand look at them, and they'll do that so you don't have to put that through an x-ray machine. Um, I I probably will. I'll, it's safe to leave things. I'll be. I'll, I'll be here. Yeah, we're gonna have some, a few people here. Um, you know, don't leave a lot of money sitting around or something like that. But I think computers. Please do. Yeah, please. Tony says leave some money around. But yeah. So however. But yes, we will have people in the room.
Can I ask everyone to get to their table, please? It's 10.55. I've been informed we have a hard stop in 65 minutes. Gregory, yes. could you introduce Denise? Oh, yes. I'm so, I, I introduced Denise before, but we have changed counsel. So we now have Denise Morelli uh, with us, who will be counsel for these discussions. Musical chairs. Musical chairs, right. So basically, uh, Sally was for accreditation issues. We have one other issue that Beth will be coming back up for. Uh, I believe that's pre-accreditation. But we're going to get into the definitions in, in uh, part 600. So if you want to pull that up, sorry. Um, before we get started, Amory is going to address a, a protocol issue with you, and uh, so I'll turn the floor over to her. I thought I was going to the other committee member meeting. Um, so there was some discussion with some of the members of the full committee and members of the subcommittee about how the full committee protocols apply to you. Generally speaking, for negotiated rulemaking, the full committee comes to consensus on protocols about how the full committee will operate. We did not do the same type of thing with this committee because it's a subcommittee. You're not a decision-making body. It's a little more informal. Uh, but there were some discussions about people speaking with the press. And so I wanted to read to you just very briefly one item from the protocols from the full committee members and just have a really quick thought about whether that might be appropriate for this group as well. And it's about contact with the media. It says contact with the media, investment community, or other organizations outside of the community of interest represented by the member will generally be limited to discussion of the overall objectives and progress of the negotiators. Members will refrain from characterizing the views, motives, and interests of other members during contact with the media, investment community, or other organizations outside of their community of interest represented by the member and to the general public, including through social media. So the thought was that if you are speaking with the press, that you can talk about how you feel about what you're discussing, but that you wouldn't characterize the views of somebody else. So that Russell wouldn't say, well, Meredith said, and Meredith thinks, and you know, it would only be what Russell thinks. So sorry to pick on you. Um, you were the one who was right in front of me. <laughs> and unlike Greg, I do have progressive lenses, so I can see from the middle to there, but I can't see the names down there, they get blurry. So these are a mix blessing. They're good in some ways, but then I start doing that. So it's, I'm still getting used to them. But I've just now given away my age in addition to all that other stuff. Um, but I think what we would like to hear from is, would people be agreeable to that type of thing where you're not characterizing the views of others, that you are free to reach out to anybody within your community of interest, that you are always getting input from them, seeking advice from them, hearing what they think, making sure you're representing them, but that if you did talk with the press, you wouldn't characterize viewpoints that you heard around the table from other people because you may get their viewpoints wrong and that way you're not speaking for others. I, I, I saw a thumb go up, so maybe we want to do a thumb uh, temperature check if that's agreeable to everybody. And if it's not, I can't see everybody, but if it's not everyone. agreeable, just to let us know. Why? Okay, so we've got agreement. So I thank you for that piece. 
and I will go up to the other two subcommittees now, let you continue your work, and just thank you again for the cooperation. Thank you, Anne Marie. Okay, we're going to uh, begin looking at the uh, at institutional eligibility, and particularly, and uh, starting at 600.2, we're back with our definitions. And the first one I'd like to take a look at uh, in a red lines is a, the definition of um, additional location and branch campus. You'll, you'll note in the uh, on page one of the uh, document, which has contains the red lines for part 600 that we are adding a definition of additional location. So let's take a look at that. And we're defining additional location as a campus that is not geographically apart and at which the institution offers at least 50% of a program and clarifying that it may qualify as a branch campus. We um, have always at the department had the concept of branch of additional locations and in fact <clears throat> most additional locations are uh, are approved as such not not branch campuses so this is a uh, the, the first time however that we've put i believe in the regulation the actual definition of what additional location is you can see that uh, uh, differentiated uh, from a branch campus so note that a branch campus is is an additional location so what we're saying here is an additional location can be a branch campus but a branch campus is an additional location of an institution geographically apart, independent from the main institution, and we consider the location of an institution to be independent of the main campus if the location is permanent in nature. You can see that it has to uh, uh, offer, uh, offer degrees and recognized credentials, have its own faculty and administrative, administrative and supervisory organization, and its own budgetary and hiring authority. So you can see that that's what we use to, to uh, draw the distinction between what is a branch uh, what is a, was considered a true a branch and what will be considered an additional location um, again this I think just uh, puts in regulation what those definitions are any discussion around that Leah I'm just curious about may qualify as a branch I mean you know a branch as I understand it you know can have its own OPE ID it can have a lot of autonomy and does this language mean that institutions can move additional locations which typically have their authority from a branch or a main um, does this give more flexibility for additional locations to kind of move in and out of that kind of territory I'm wondering if maybe financial aid can help us kind of parse through this as as it relates to eligibility for program participation go ahead David uh, so, so I think that's a good question, um, but I want to point out some additional context. Um, first, there is often some confusion about what we mean when we say branch campus. Uh, in many cases, um, it, folks think of it in the way that it's, that it's defined in uh, IPEDS, um, where a branch campus meets certain characteristics, so it has different reporting requirements, et cetera. Um, but for purposes of um, Title IV uh, eligibility, uh, branch campus is a very specific definition that is that is listed below and the biggest impact that having a branch hamp campus has is that once you've established a branch campus and you can see all of the requirements for um, autonomy here you can you can make that branch campus into a fully eligible standalone institution without otherwise meeting the two-year operation requirement. So while it's operating as a branch campus, you're you're essentially meeting the two-year uh, requirement for operation before you can become a new institution. So what we're doing here is not really changing anything about how about the policy that's already established. We're just making um, it clear in the regulation what an additional location is, um, and keeping in mind that an additional location is a location that uh, is, is part of a, a, a larger main campus and has its own eight-digit OPE ID, uh, whereas the main campus has, a, has its as the six-digit sort of base OPE ID. So additional locations are considered part of the overall institution, um, and the same is true of branch campuses. They're all part of the, uh, the larger institution that is treated as, as a one unit by law. Answer your question, Leah. Okay. Jillian? Thank you. 
Thanks. Uh, so based on my conversations, I'm understanding that there are there have been sort of some differences in how different accreditors or accreditors in the department have defined and understood these terms. So I'm just curious if you have a sense, and maybe this is for um, – was her name Beth? I'm sorry. Um, if uh, what impact do you expect there to be on accreditors in terms of the differences that you all have seen and how they've um, adapted these terms? Sorry. Um, hi again. I, I don't anticipate there being major changes. I think that most of the agencies have at this point um, been utilizing the similar language. So. Uh, I don't see it as a major change for them. Gregory? Any other comments related to um, additional location or branch campus? Right, Sue? Um, I want to make sure, and I believe this will come more under uh, 600.9, but the unintended consequence that has really impacted um, health care and those institutions such as ours and other osteopathic or PA training schools um, is that many times we are sending students on clinical rotations and we are sending them outside of our own state. So the unintended con consequence has been um, many institutions then in those states have to apply criteria for physical presence. And this is where I just want to make sure as we talk about the term branch campus, um, if we are sending students out to do a clinical rotation on a pediatric urology uh, rotation, they are not probably going to be doing that in the state of Iowa, and so they cross over into another state to do that. Um, so. The term branch campus does have an impact, I believe, when we get to 600.9, um, and you've addressed it, it looks like, through state authorization, which has been a wonderful tool that we've been able to use. But um, I just want to make sure that you understand that that has applied lots of additional costs to us in those states where uh, physical presence, you know, we do not have it. David? I keep forgetting to use the card. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, an, that's a good point. Um, and I, I also want to defer maybe to our, to our council a little bit on this, but I believe that m some of the issues that you're describing are requirements by states, not necessarily requirements of the department. Um, the department, for the most part, um, only requires you to report an additional location if uh, at least uh, if, if the, a student could complete at least 50% or more of the program. But even if you have a location that doesn't meet that definition, if a state has certain requirements for you to meet, uh, if, you're, if you have a location in their state that doesn't, for example, offer 50% of the program, you still have to meet the state's requirements. Um, so while the department, you know, we, we can't override those requirements. You know, we, we, the state can, can impose the requirements that it needs to. So I don't know if, if, if there's something that, you know, we could change here that could be helpful to you, and we're certainly open to that. But I think we, there's certainly not much that we can do about the states having those kinds of requirements in place. All right. Carry on, Greg. All right, we're going to uh, continue with the discussion of uh, the definition of a clock hour, and uh, David will lead that discussion. All right, so scrolling down a little bit, um, going down to, Scott has it up on the screen now, uh, definition of a clock hour. So a, the, a clock hour is a very long-standing uh, definition in our regulations. Uh, and its importance is that um, if you have a clock hour program you and, and you are providing Title IV aid um, using the clock hour rules, then you have to monitor um, a student's attendance by clock hour. So you have to watch when they clock in, watch when they clock out, and ensure that um, you have carefully uh, monitored the amount of time that they've spent um, in their actually in attendance and working on their coursework. Uh, when the regulation was originally promulgated, um, 
frankly, there was no concept of distance education. It didn't exist. It was as long before that was even thought of. So you have, if you can see, what, what existed before our edits was a 50 to 60 minute class, lecture or recitation in a 60 minute period, a 50 to 60 minute faculty supervised laboratory, shop training or internship in a 60 minute period, or 60 minutes of preparation in a correspondence course, which did exist at the time that we last um, edited this regulation. But there really wasn't um, a definition that applied or clearly applied to a program offered through distance education. And so what we've done is add one, um, and it's under uh, four uh, here on the screen. Uh, what we've added uh, is the following. Uh, so a clock hour in a distance education environment is 50 to 60 minutes in a 60 minute period of consecutive or non-consecutive academic engagement through distance education. So we're specifically calling out distance education here. For purposes of this definition, academic engagement is defined by the institution and includes, but is not limited to, attending a synchronous class, lecture, or recitation online, interacting with a faculty member or participating in an online discussion about academic matters, participating in interactive tutorials or computer-assisted instruction, or taking exams. Academic engagement does not include logging into an online class or tutorial without active participation or participating in academic, or participating in academic counseling or advisement. So we've also added two additional conditions. The first one is a clock hour in a distance education program must meet all accrediting agency and state requirements, including restrictions on the number of clock hours in a program that may be offered through distance education. And two, an institution must be capable of monitoring a student's academic engagement in 50 out of 60 minutes for each clock hour under this definition. The purpose of this definition is to establish a framework for colleges to offer clock hour programs through distance education and to clearly in, uh, establish what's necessary for them to, number one, have the clock hours uh, and make, ensure that they are in compliance with uh, the oversight requirements that are established, and two, monitor those clock hours and ensure that there's, they, for example, know who the student is. Um, adequately um, determine that the student is actually engaged during the period that you're counting the clock hour. David. Um, so just a clarification here, David. Um, a face-to-face 400-student -face lecture hall where I'm just sitting listening is okay. But doing the same thing online is not. Is that right? Keeping, keep in mind that most of the lecture halls that you might encounter would be offered in credit hours. Uh, we're going to address the definition of credit hour in a moment. If that lecture hall environment was offered in clock hours, then the same requirements of that, that existed before we added this definition would apply. But if it was offered through distance education, then you'd have these additional requirements. Russell? Uh, let's see, a comment and a question that uh, in section four there that uh, the second sentence uh, for purposes of the definition all the way down to uh, uh, in the next sentence all the way down to advisement, that that seems like that's, uh, you see academic engagement, I've seen it called academic activity, uh, I've seen that in financial aid handbook, and I don't know if it's referenced elsewhere, but it almost seems like we now have a definition within a definition and wonder if that would be something that would make sense to pull out since I know it's been referred, the same sort of thing is referred to and uh, returned to Title IV and all that. And then my, so I'll respond, let you respond to that, then I have a question. Go ahead. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's actually a very good point. Um, so the language that you see here is very similar to what exists in the return of Title IV um, requirements. I believe it's uh, 668.22L, uh, where we define academic activity. Um, and we can certainly consider, uh, I don't think we thought about this, but we can consider um, potentially pulling out that concept and putting it into the definitions, and we'll take that back. Yeah, I think you did a good job in other places of trying to get Definition is one place, and so because if they're in two places, they always end up different, right? Okay, so that that would be the first thing on that. Um, on uh, section II there, on section two, I'm still a little bit. I, I heard you start to talk about monitoring. I'm still scratching my head <laughs> as what monitoring would look like. Could you could you expand a little bit more on monitor, monitoring, and do we need to 
add any more thoughts about what that would look like? Or I'm, I'm just uh, worried about we put things in there that aren't defined and then it gets defined differently later. Um, so yeah, I would say that we're very interested in uh, in the committee's thoughts about what um, what monitoring should constitute and what requirements should be established in regulation. Um, just as an example, um, so so you guys are aware in FSA we've gotten a number of questions for institutions that are offering these kinds of programs um, and our policy to date even though it wasn't clearly expressed in the regulations is that as long as the institution had a, a, a a computer system that could adequately monitor the student's engagement, then um, we would consider that to be acceptable. But we didn't put any boundaries around exactly what that meant um, because we, we felt that we needed a regu regulatory language to do that. Um, the, there's a couple of examples that I can give. In one example, the institution had a system that actually was so it, it, it had the capability of actually monitoring students' keystrokes and, and, and displaying exactly what the student was doing in their electronic system at all times. So it could show, it, it, they could pull, pull a report that showed that the student, for example, was watching a video during this time, was completing a test, was uh, working on an assignment, was listening to a lecture synchronously. Um, and we, we, we considered that to be adequate um, to, to include the, the clock hour. Uh, there are, but there are also other possible um, ways that a school could do that. The, the fundamental thing that we're looking for, though, is that the school has the ability to show that the student is engaged for 50 out of 60 minutes during, during any hour that's counted for Title IV purposes. Go ahead, Dan. I apologize. Uh, so one thing following up on that, so the monitoring of, that you're uh, describing, I think that there are other areas where we start getting into privacy concerns and that uh, there is, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, I think it's in the academic integrity language and some other some others where we have just something where uh, there's at least a sentence that's put in there about uh, uh, the, the, the institution looking at privacy concerns. I wish I could pull up the language out of my head, but as soon as you, as soon as you said that, that then red flags and started going off about uh, about those issues as well. Leah, um, I'd like to know more about what programs are being considered for this format. Um, my experience in clock hour programs tend to be in the, the very tactile, like <laughs> welding or HVAC, cosmetology, massage therapy, where you, you're measuring the hours of practice that student has had in that kind of field. Um, I'm wondering, because distant DEAC, we haven't seen a lot of activity come to us, whether Title IV or not, in clock hour format. So could you share with us maybe what you're hearing at the department about a need? Um, yeah, I can give you a couple of examples of, uh, of programs, uh, institutions that have come to us with this question. Um, in one case, it was a cosmetology program um, that wanted to allow students to take the um, textbook coursework online and, were, and do all of the clinical hands-on work at the actual um, uh, uh, school, school grounds. So the institution would generally, um, the student would have to go through some material, they would have to read um, the material, they would have to then take a test online, they would watch a video online that kind of explained how the process worked, how, how what whatever skill it was that they were working on, um, and those hours counted would count toward their, their total clock hours, but ultimately the student would then have to come in on, on the school grounds and perform the actual activities on, on, the, on an individual to, sh to demonstrate that they had the appropriate skill. Most of the programs that we've seen have been uh, hybrid programs in which part of the program is taught um, on, on site and part of the program is taught di through distance ed. Uh, and, I, and I don't want to speak for the institution, but what, they t what, what the ones that we've talked to have told us is that they believe that um, it gives the student more flexibility and there's a, there's a desire to allow them to take whatever coursework that they can take through distance ed while ensuring that they do come in and perform all of the actual um, clinical work or work that requires them to be on site to actually do that at, on, on campus. Did you have a follow-up? 
I, I would just say maybe maybe for this group, you know, as this language goes forward, we might want to recommend that the accrediting body have very specific procedures to verify student activities, teaching and learning in the clock hour setting online. So I can see that being a very different approach than what we do typically. And we're very used to looking at credit hour allocations as accreditors. Um, but the clock hour piece, at least from an EAC <coughs> perspective, we haven't done a lot of work in that area. So it might be good to make that recommendation for the accreditation recognition criteria. Amanda. I have two separate questions relating to the clause. Um, the first one would be, what were your thoughts on what computer-assisted instruction would mean? Like, if you can give me an example, um, or interactive tutorials. Um, computer-assisted instruction seems too broad, in my opinion. So I'm just, I would want to make clear what exactly that what the Department of Ed was intending to define there. And then the second question I had, or clarification, just in my limited knowledge, um, as I read the second part, uh, a clock hour and a distance education program must meet all accrediting agency and state requirements. I think I'm just trying to understand why the Department of Ed um, only limited um, it to meet just accrediting agency and state requirements and not have any, and the Department of Ed just kind of leaving it to those two, um, two bodies. Um, for your last point, can you give me an example of what else we might have done? Like who, who else are we would defer to or what other things we might have included? I guess to me, it wouldn't the Department of Ed would also like to have more regulation or input on what's happening and not just defer to states and accrediting agencies, at least in, there could be some type of, like in previously the compliance reports and the monitoring reports, you would you not have any, any type of hand or overlook at all in distance education when they're making decisions on credit hours since it, this does allow them to have access to more aid? Gregory. Well, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, typically we, when it comes to, and really, I know it's a little bit gray, but you're delving into like an, a more of an academic area, you know, what constitutes the uh, <clears throat> the academics of a program that's online. And <clears throat> for the most part, the department defers to uh, to accreditors for that, for that type of thing. We do regulated accreditors and we do have standards for them to meet, but we would, uh, for what you're talking about there, the way this regulation is constructed, we, we would typically uh, look to the accreditor, sometimes the state, but mostly the accreditor, to determine um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, appropriateness of the academic content, which in this case is the online content. So I, th I think that's largely why uh, why it's it's written this way. We do talk about that they have to be capable of monitoring the engagement. So th those are the kinds of rules we, we impose on schools. You have to monitor the actual engagement. But as far as the uh, uh, the appropriateness of the of the uh, online content, we would we would typically not go there. It's outside of our purview. And uh, want to respond what, what, just to that for the first part of your question about computer-assisted instruction. Um, we had in mind there um, a variety of different things that um, that a student might be doing online. Um, again, this this one, this particular definition, much of it was developed for return of Title IV purposes um, to identify um, academic activity, and this this concept of computer-assisted instruction was partly in, in, intended to include things like um, working in a class um, on something in, actu in an actual on-campus classroom. Um, but in, the, in a distance education environment, we would also include things like, um, you know, the student is, is reading a textbook, uh, reading his or her textbook and, and, you know, having to answer questions about what they're reading as they go along. Um, things where they're not just sort of passively taking in the information, but they're actually having to engage with the, uh, with the coursework. Um, this definition is intended to sort of separate 
um, a student simply simply reading and preparing to take a test or something from being engaged and actually sort of participating. And, and that's one of the things that we're trying to establish here. Denise, did you want to share something? Well, I, I just wanted to add on to what Greg was saying that about us staying out of certain areas. We're legally prohibited from getting into the content, and so that's why the provision is in there about the accrediting standards. So it wouldn't be that we would be abdicating completely because we'd still be looking at the monitoring part of it for compliance, but we can't get into certain areas about how many hours are allowed to be this and online or that. That would be the accrediting body and licensing body because we're prohibited from oversight on that. Go ahead. I just want to respond. Thank you for clarifying that. That makes it clarified for the second part. The first part then, um, David, would and for the engagement piece, I I think computer-assisted instruction does not do you justice in, in the intent of engagement. I think participating in interactive tutorials isn't, in my opinion, the best word, but interactive, I like truly support that. That's I think that should be the goal of distance ed is to have as many engagement. And as you said, it's not just a computer assisted pro like instruction. It's more of the engagement piece. So I think I would like to see more language that really clarifies that and just says that instead of computer assisted instruction. I don't think that gets to the point of what you're talking about engagement. Jessica. Thank you. Um, I, some of you at Ed might be familiar, but my office has a hotline uh, with respect to a network of sham beauty schools that operated between 1986 and 1994. We've gotten hundreds, maybe even over a thousand calls um, over the past year for people who are still suffering the effects of their federal student loans, um, often tax offset wage garnishment. I think that to the extent that this regulation is designed for programs that are, I would say, disproportionately Im affecting low-income students, I just think that this is really an area that is ripe for fraud. And I obviously this is going to be a conversation we're going to be having like in multiple parts in this subcommittee. But I just have, you know, we see it every day where this it just it it goes for thirty years in people's lives, um, and I just want to take very seriously to the extent that we're writing rules to try and let more of those programs in the door precisely how we're making sure that they're high quality and I think you know obviously we have to change with the times but um, I think the problem of certain schools targeting low-income students with low quality education and selling them goods that don't pan out and that really being like doubly damaging because of their low incomes is important Already. Thank you. I guess I have, I have three pieces. One is more uh, tactical. I'd, I'd say be careful on the monitoring piece. Um, we see our students all the time, and this is K through 12 as well as university, um, and I don't speak so much to the trades, but downloading, they'll download a video that they've been told to watch, and that's no different than sitting in a lecture hall or anywhere else and watching it. I also hazard a bit to say preparing for a test is not the same thing or it's different because that's exactly what you do when you go to a lecture and the faculty member holds us, you know, when I would hold a prep session for a class. But I am, I am concerned a bit on this, and I think because I'm, I'm struggling a bit, and you answered it a bit with Leah's question, um, but where do you see this coming in? I, this feels to me like an area that we're not really savvy on. Um, we have a lot of gray area going on in this learning as we're looking at um, releasing Pell for inmates, for an example. Uh, monitoring, that takes all of that out because you can't monitor them online. Um, and I think there's other ways of, um, of having interactive communication. So I'm trying to find the balance between, you know, I don't know if this measures quality. I don't know the idea that somebody's interacting with somebody measures the relevancy or the quality of an academic or, or preparatory beauty program, whatever. So I just feel like maybe we're throwing the wrong thing at it. Can you, David, do you have a sense or Gregory where changes, where this, um, going back to downstream, what might this impact? Where um, might people come back to this and say, oh, but we so decided this in time. I'll do my best with this one because I, I'm not a psychic and I can't tell you exactly what, the, what will happen downstream. Um, but first I want to say that 
this is attempting to make our current policy into a regula regulation. Um, so we are aware that schools are slow, and I would say it's fairly slow in the sector that we're talking about in clock hour schools. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, at least from in my experience with uh, programs and institutions asking questions on this topic, I haven't seen large scale moves uh, in the clock hour world toward um, trying to have everything be through distance ed. Um, but we are aware that schools are slowly moving in that direction in an attempt to provide more flexibility um, to their students uh, and to ensure that they have materials that are more accessible and that potentially even um, they can pay less for their education because they don't need their on-ground facilities as often. So this regulatory language is an attempt by the department to well, for, back, for lack of a better phrase, get out in front of this a little bit and establish some, some criteria that will apply to most of these programs, but that is limited to our oversight of the Title IV programs, which is really the scope of our authority. Uh, and so we're not here, we're not trying to get into how good the program is. That's the really the accrediting agency's role. We're just trying to establish what's necessary for us to consider something to be a clock hour and and count for, and this is the important part, especially for the, the department and the, and the taxpayer, and count toward the student receiving additional disbursements of Title IV aid, because that's what this ultimately is is doing. When they earn a clock hour, they're one clock hour closer to getting more more Title IV money as they complete more of their program. I, this is Greg. I just want to. One thing to what David said, which was excellent, that. <clears throat> to kind of tack on to what he said, that without this change, it wouldn't be as if clock hour programs that operate in distance would be ineligible. They're not. This is a, this is like a reflection of a current of current policy. So I don't want anybody to get the impression that right now you cannot have a clock hour program that's measured in distance by distance. A lot of people feel that that's the case, but that's erroneous. It isn't. So we're not adding an eligibility here that doesn't already exist. Okay. Jillian? Uh, I think we have a oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Well, I, I certainly salute wanting to kind of codify the process for clock hour programs and, and Title IV eligibility. Um, I do think that there's some kind of cascading issues that come from this. Um, there's conversations about outsourcing, um, you know, for distance ed. Um, you know, clock hour programs um, would have to do their own kind of state authorization state by state by state because they're not covered by something by Sarah because they're non-degree. Um, so, so I think that we might want to, as we look at this issue um, and look at this language, think about some of the parallel matters that come into play when you're implementing distance ed at the clock hour on a clock hour basis instead of credit hour. But, but I do see how there could be a need for hybrid approaches to teaching and learning in programs that are measured in clock hours as opposed to, to credit hours. I, I do think the accreditation community and the licensing agencies and the examination organizations um, that verify the student learning have to engage. Thank you. Jillian. Sure. Um, so I just want to, I think, to what Russ said and then also speaking a little bit to, to Amanda's comment. Um, you know, I think from my perspective, it would be helpful if the language in here that's talking about sort of what academic engagement looks like tracked back to other places where we talk about it. So for example, like the distance ed definition, um, or maybe it's just in guidance that you pulled some of this actual language from David. But um, I just think to the extent that we can minimize these sorts of differences between delivery models, it's useful in protecting against fraud, it's useful in consistency, it's useful in making sure we're not unintentionally creating loopholes. Um, and I think that gets a bit to what Amanda was saying too in terms of like the weird language that we know exists currently in the distance ed definition in general about CD-ROMs and whatever. Um, so I think to the extent that we can sort of shore that up, it's probably useful in this process since the requirements in that respect would be the same. Yeah, we, we're, that, that's a great point and we'll take that back. Amanda. Just kidding. Go ahead. Gregory. Yep. Um, so, yeah, we, we'll, we'll go ahead and move on then. Um, you guys, we, we would welcome other suggestions. Um, if you guys want to think about this one for a while, if you have specific things that you would like to suggest, for example, with the monitoring or anything else, uh, we'll, we'd be interested in that as before we report back to the full committee. 
So with that, I'm going to move on down um, to uh, the definition of a correspondence course. All right, so um, uh, the definition of a correspondence course um, is a very old definition. Um, it, uh, I believe, and my counsel hopefully will, will correct me if I'm wrong, that it originated back in 1992 um, when Congress made some changes to the Higher Education Act to put some uh, restrictions on correspondence courses. Um, after a correspondence courses uh, were, in, were, were restricted in that way for many years, um, distance education became more popular, uh, and Congress then made changes to separate um, correspondence courses from distance education, where distance education uh, did not have all of the restrictions that applied to correspondence courses. And some of those restrictions include um, an institution lacks uh, eligibility if half of its students or half of its courses are enrolled in correspondence courses. Sorry, if half of its students are correspondence students or half of its courses are correspondence. Um, so the definition of a correspondence course here in the regulations is really part of um, separating uh, distance education from correspondence, uh, which has significant impacts um, on, on it. For, ex for example, an institution's eligibility and how much aid a student can receive in a correspondence program versus a distance education program. So the change that we've made here uh, under correspondence course uh, is that uh, we have change the word the instructor to instructors, um, uh, assuming that, uh, and well, let me just read, the, read it aloud so that it makes it a little clearer. So correspondence course is a course provided by an institution under which the institution provides instructional materials by mail or electronic transmission, including examinations on the materials to students who are separated from the instructor. Interaction between instructors and students is limited and is not regular and substantive. Um, as defined by the institution's accrediting agency. So the main purposes of these changes, uh, and you'll see similar types of changes reflected in the, de in the definition of distance education in just a few minutes, but the main purposes of these changes are, um, number one, to uh, reflect that interaction can occur between a student and multiple instructors, instructors at, the, at the same institution. It doesn't have to be just one instructor. Uh, and to put the definition of correspondence course in the hands of the accrediting agency, reflecting the accrediting agency's role as the arbiter of academic quality uh, and letting them uh, d define what that means in relation to distance education. So I'll stop there and see if we have questions. And Jillian. My favorite topic, thanks. Um, okay, so I have several questions. Um, the first is, so I have concerns in general about um, creating the conditions for a race to the bottom in terms of how um, correspondence is defined, distance ed is defined, um, regular and substantive. So looking forward to a really fulsome conversation with y'all on that um, as we move along. But um, I have, I think, four comments, questions, et cetera, to make. I'll try and keep them brief. So the first is I have concerns about, and this, you know, I think it's a little bit chicken and egg to talk about this without having looked at the distance ed definition. So I think we'll probably have to circle back mm -hmm. maybe after we get to the distance ed part and see how the conversations we have there relate to here. Um, but this idea of instructors and students, um, I understand what you're trying to do, but I am concerned about scenarios where um, an institution can staff a phone line with a different faculty member every day um, that would be available for 30 minutes. And I'm being really hyperbolic here, right? But this is what I'm concerned about, um, where a different faculty member sits in the seat for 30 minutes every day to answer phone calls, and that counts um, as sort of meeting this definition of um, the interaction, um, not or the course not being correspondent. So, um, you know, want to figure out how we can have conversations about um, clarifying the language or putting some safeguards in place to make sure that that instructor role is really um, protected with respect to institutions of higher education. Um, because I think if we don't, then we risk sort of calling into question what an institution of higher education is in general, um, which I'll probably say that sort of several times throughout this morning, this afternoon. So that's my first comment. Um, my second um, is related to the prim primarily initiated by the student um, conversation. So same sort of thing, right? I, um, again, being hyperbolic, what if an institution says, oh, I'm going to have this 30-minute um, 
time every week that a student can call in and that will um, not require me to do any proactive outreach on behalf of a faculty member reaching out to a student. So again, I have concerns about what that does with our understanding of what institution of higher education is and how we understand that faculty instructor role to um, play an integral part in that. Um, three, I have um, concerns about moving the regular and substantive um, sort of definition and monitoring, et cetera, to the accrediting agency. And I, I, I can table that comment, I guess, because we're going to talk about that when we get to that point in here. So I'm, I'm fine sort of um, in the interest of not being duplicative. We can talk about that later, but I'll just say I have concerns. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, so then, and then my fourth comment, like I said at the beginning, is I would like to come back to this definition once we have a fulsome conversation also about the distance ed changes um, and the regular and substantive changes. Uh, and yeah, we're, we're glad to return to this after our um, bigger discussion about uh, distant, the definition of distance education. Um, so if, if folks have questions, I'd be happy to answer them now, but uh, I think it is a good idea for us to kind of move on after we've answered those questions and then come back to have the bigger, to include this in the bigger discussion of distance ed. So, but let me, yeah, let me see who has questions or if there's anything else that folks would like to say first. Well, yeah. Maybe not answer this question now, but I'm, I'm wondering about the practical application of deferring these definitions to accreditors um, only because as program participation reviews take place, often the accreditor is asked, what are your policies around certain things so we can do a program review, you know, attendance taking. Um, if let's say um, you're in the Philadelphia case team and so you have middle states, DEAC, ACCSC, you know, you know, a host of institutional creditors that might mean that the, the case teams have to start working around all of these definitions. And I'd like to talk about that. Maybe not right now, David, but at some point, because we've deferred a lot of this to creditors, what does that mean in the practical application of program reviews and that type of thing? We'll certainly talk about that in just a few minutes. Um, Jessica. Sorry, do you want, are we just... Do you want no comments now on all of no, this? No, please. Or it just yeah. seems so intertwined with distance that I'm not yeah, sure. If you'd, like, if you'd like to hold them until the distance education discussion, you're welcome to. But yeah, if anyone wants to have make any other comments or questions about this specific one first, or, you know, I welcome them, but we can move on otherwise. Okay. Let's, go, let's go ahead. Thank you, David. Okay, we're going to move on to a discussion of the definition of uh, credit hour now. Kind of, in a way, dread this because this is something which definitely uh, I know people have have definite feelings about. Um, so, I think I think we might we might do well to look at what the current definition of a credit hour is, and then and then from that look at what the proposed changes are instead of the the, the other way around. So, you can see here that uh, we've read these changes, the way these changes are set up, and we maybe should have discussed this earlier, the the lined out portions are the, uh, uh, red lined out are the current, um, is the current regulatory language, and what's underlined is uh, is the uh, new proposed language. <clears throat> so you can see that uh, the credit hour definition, an amount of work represented in intended learning outcomes and verified by evidence of student achievement that is institutionally established, that is an institutionally established equivalency that reasonably approximates not less than a, a one hour of classroom or direct faculty instruction and a minimum of two hours of out of out of class student work each week for approximately 15 weeks for one semester or trimester hour of credit or 10 to 12 weeks for one quarter hour of credit or the equivalent amount of work over a different time frame or at least the equivalent amount of work required in paragraph one of this definition for other academic activities established by the institution, including laboratory work, internships, practica, studio work, and other academic work leading to uh, the award of credit hours. And then how that would be changed is the credit hour now would be uh, Defined by an institution, and uh, is a, is a uh, is defined by an institution and approved by the institution's accreditor, and based upon the amount of work, uh, unit of time spent engaged in learning activities, and or a set of clearly defined learning objectives or competencies. 
you can see that what we're doing here with the definition of a credit hour is allowing institutions and accreditors to determine how they will evaluate academic progress. We, we are interested in uh, your feedback in how, uh, what you feel about this language. If you, if you don't uh, like that language or have, have problems with it, what language you might propose. Um, I, I'll give you my, my own just, just observation in, in, in dealing with the definition of credit hour. I, I always found, I'm not going to take any stance one way or the other on, on, on this, except to say that the current definition, when you have words like um, uh, institutionally established equivalency that reasonably approximates, I think that, uh, so I'm a firm believer that we need change, we need change there. I mean, I know some people are very wedded to this, this initial, this, this definition, but I've always been of the opinion that it, it didn't give people a whole lot when you, when you use words like that. So really what we did originally, I think in the initial, uh, this definition which went back to 2010, right? 2010, the program integrity regs, it basically said, you know, it reasonably approximates and what's below there is the, is, is, in, in, for the most part, the old Carnegie unit. You know, so we're departing from that now, and, and you, as you can see, giving a lot more latitude to the institution and a creditor as to what's going to constitute that, that clock hour and, and moving away from uh, a more defined, although it was loosely defined, uh, uh, um, parameters as to what a credit hour could be. So I'll just open the floor for discussion on, on, on the topic. Jillian. Thanks. Uh, I just have a few comments. So I think it would be useful for this group, well, so my perspective, is it would be useful for this group to also see um, the guidance that was subsequently issued with respect to the credit hour definition after this definition was codified. Um, because I, um, my remembering of what happened, it feels like a lifetime ago, right, was this definition came out, I think a lot of people were upset about it and concerned and et cetera, and then the department came back out with additional guidance that provided for credit hour equivalencies and some other things. And I think that was really important in helping move um, folks to a place where they felt comfortable that it wasn't necessarily stifling innovation, but also providing some guardrails in terms of protecting taxpayer dollars. Um, I, my own sort of perspective is I would prefer to see this language um, retained here and then add in language that um, accounts for the guidance that was given that allowed a little bit more latitude with respect to what this definition looks like. Um, along with my comment earlier about um, regular and substantive, for example, I'm concerned about moving this to accreditors, especially if the department um, is really concerned about transferability of credits between institutions that are accredited by different types of accreditors. Seems to me like you're going to exacerbate that problem by creating um, a whole lot of different expectations that institutions are following based on who their creditor is, and that's going to create um, challenges when that student then wants to move to an institution that's accredited by a different accreditor. I think those are my thoughts. Thanks. Um, one one quick clarification, and I, I think I think this actually is part of what you were saying. But in, under a current policy, an accreditor does ultimately have the authority to set policies about the credit hour. It's just that those policies have a sort of floor that is established in, in the regulation as it currently is written. Um, this would still give the accreditor the ultimate authority to, to define the credit hour. It just wouldn't have all of the requirements that uh, that exist in the current regulation. Yeah, my perspective is those requirements were put in there for good reason, and I just want to make sure that we don't lose sight of that from a consumer protection perspective. The other thing, I'm sorry, I know, I'll be super quick, is I think especially um, from the lens of direct assessment, right, that provides flexibility for institutions to operate outside of the credit hour. And so I have concerns about what this does to the direct assessment provision potentially um, if all of a sudden we're potentially creating a scenario where an accreditor can say your program looks like direct assessment but isn't but we're going to allow for that now because we have the flexibility to do so. So um, we'd just like to continue to think about it from that lens too. Leah. Um, I'd also like to express a concern about unintended consequences for students. Um, one of the other broad goals of this process is to allow easier transfer of credit student mobility of what they learn and how they learn. Um, if we don't have a common framework around the units of those learning and we have different accreditors defining it different ways, I think we've created a lot of confusion for students. Um, 
I was among the folks in 2010 that cried foul at the federal definition of credit hour. How dare you? Um, but then as I watched accrediting organizations through my work with Chia start to implement it and then implement it at DEAC, I see how closely we've been able to map those units of learning to outcomes at course, program, and institution level. And when we're all working from this framework, um, I think it benefits students to have a clear understanding of what those units are behind what they're learning. Um, there's a lot more to say about this. That's all I'm going to say for now. I'm sure we're probably ready for lunch. Okay. So, <laughs> In 12 minutes. All right. Um, I think it's Russell and then Jody. Well, I look at this, and I, I do share some of the concerns that were that have been uh, stated so far. And my overall impression is that this is uh, too big a leap uh, for for right now. I think I think uh, if we're really looking, if we were to start over and do this all that we uh, from uh, where we're at uh, today, that we wouldn't have come up with the Carnegie unit, uh, and, and that's a whole historical thing, and it's in there, and it's in all of our systems, and we're going to have to. Uh, address that and in having it uh, this loosely defined um, and set by all the accrediting agencies I just don't see how that's that's going to work that doesn't mean we should start to think about and, and, and it's I have a very loose idea about you know everybody's moving towards like a competency based thing but how do you measure that and how are competencies different and how do we make sure that there's not somebody in Washington DC or Rob at Chio is coming up with all the ideas of what every competency looks like. So there's, there's, there's a, it's a major shift in terms of how higher education operates. It can't be done all at once, but it doesn't mean you don't start and that we try to figure out what is that path to get from here to there. But I think if you don't do that path, if you just jump to something that is as uh, as loose as what I see this is, that I think that will have um, uh, uh, chaos and probably harm from this. Jody? David. Oh, David would? No? Um, <laughs> is it close enough? Um, I just want to clarify, is this definition that you put in, this is the way it was before the credit hour definition? was put in? Uh, is prior, it a return prior, to prior? No, we didn't have it. We did not have there a definition, was no definition of credit hour prior before. to 2010. Okay. But it was, there was no definition, but there was, at least, but so essentially it was as presented in this definition because it was defined by an institution yeah, that, and approved by the equator. That, that's right. In practice, um, okay, what's, so what's here in the language is how it worked before 2010. Um, we, we do reference and we did reference the credit, the credit hour throughout our regulations and it has a very important impact in determining, for example, how much aid a student gets, similar, again, similar to the clock hour but different in some important ways. Credit hours establish um, the enrollment status for students, which prorates the amount of, for example, Pell Grants that they receive. And it also establishes half-time enrollment, which makes students eligible for direct loans. Uh, so before 2010, all of those things still applied. It's just that we, we deferred essentially to institutions and accrediting agencies to decide what a credit hour was. Right. Um, I just want to further comment then that I, this has been something that uh, our organization has advocated for for a long time is is to to go back to that status quo be in part because um you know this is really about sort of restoring the roles of the triad and the credit hour is something that goes to the heart of an institution's autonomy to maintain control of its curricula um and so that's kind of why our position has been that we would like to see the current definition eliminated. Academic quality is really a per under should be something that's under the purview of the accreditor and not there shouldn't be a federal definition of credit hour. Um, and so partly we see this definitely we support this proposal to, because it is something that would help restore the roles of the triad and the accreditor will be responsible for ensuring that institutions are offering quality programs and the department can therefore oversee the accreditor as is envisioned by the program integrity triad. I just also wanted to ask really quickly, 
were we, were you seeing problems with in this area before? Were there instances where, or have there been instances where institutions have committed, have violated this definition since it was put into place? Because if it isn't really achieving its purpose, um, I, I would wonder why we're retaining it. Gregory. Uh, I, I believe in Councillor David can correct me if I'm wrong, that the genesis for the definition of a credit hour had, was in large part, it was to some degree anyway, uh, the result of uh, misgivings the Inspector General had about um, some institutions um, offering having very little work associated with a credit hour. There's some some instances they identified in that area. So I think there were, there was some, there were some tangible uh, 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 there weren't violations at the time, but but there were things that raised raised a red flag on, on which we based this. So it wasn't it wasn't completely it wasn't for completely arbitrary reasons that we put this into place originally. David. Um, so uh, if you if you sort of look at the other side of the spectrum, not focusing on bad actors, but focusing on really good actors. I th you know, my read is that this provides some of the flexibility that a um, uh, number of institutions have been asking for from the department when it comes to competency-based debt. My question to you, David, is that it seems like that flexibility, if we sort of read on to the next page under distance ed and regular and substantive, that flexibility is then taken away in that language. And so, so, so my question is, does regular and substantive apply to non-distance education programs? Um, no, the requirement for regular and substantive interaction uh, is part of the statutory definition of distance education and uh, applies to distance education programs in, in a way, in, at, at, for the purpose of differentiating them from correspondence programs. And it's designed for cases where a student is separated from the instructor. So, so I get that, but if if we think that regular and substantive interaction with an instructor is an important piece of the educational process, and we can debate whether it is or not, but assuming that we believe it is, then it seems to me it ought to apply across this, the spectrum. Um, so we can we sh I think we we probably want to defer some of this discussion to the to the distance education definition. But one thing I, the one thing I'll say is that regular and substantive interaction is part of the statutory definition for distance education, uh, and is and the the main reason that we are applying the regulations here uh, is to is to fulfill the statutory intent to di to distinguish between the two types of education. Um, Congress still has restrictions on correspondence courses, and the distinction is there to di distinguish between the two types. And so we have to have something in our regulations that does that. Um, but we, we, I think we'll come back to your point and discuss it more in more detail when we get to the distance debt definition. Gregory, point of clarification. You have about four minutes left. We have three placards. Uh, will we? Uh, how about we do one more, and then we keep track of who's next, and we'll right. Pick up that's what I was going to say. Then the, the remaining individuals keep their placards up, and when we come back, we'll address you. Go ahead, Jessica. I'll be very brief. Um, obviously, I only see the bad, the the things that turned out badly. So my concern here is just that it would open the door to fraud. And I guess a question maybe you could address <laughs> after lunch is. I'm just trying to figure out what the problem is that you're trying to solve. My understanding is that since the distance, um, or sorry, since the new credit hour definition went into effect in 2011, there's only been two times that Ed has found credit hour abusage, which just doesn't seem like that much to me given the spectrum of Title IV programs. And so, I, you know, there's some people in the room who, who have expertise in different areas than mine that thinks this strikes a good balance, and I'm worried about upending that balance in a way that would potentially tip against students and al allow lower quality programs in. This is Greg. Um, I think um, that the intent here was largely to recognize other types of educational um, ways of, of offering education to step outside of the, of the uh, <clears throat> 
well, as we talked about before, that the other, the existing definition is somewhat tied to a Carnegie unit. It doesn't say it has to be a Carnegie unit, but it's tied to that. And there is uh, the idea that that's a, that that is a, um, not an un, not a completely unuseful way of, of of looking at how a credit hour is constructed. But it is, but in fairness, it is somewhat antiquated, and um, uh, this would allow uh, greater flexibility. With respect to how edu how uh, content is delivered, and, and and not tie it to that as, as much to that uh, to that older definition. Um, yeah, I, I would I would concur with that. I think the other um, impetus for the change is that, in part, what you've just what you've said that we haven't really found significant issues with the credit hour since we've created the the, the regulation, and we. We believe that we have heard from institutions that it is somewhat inhibiting um, their ability to construct their programs in the way that they choose. Um, notwithstanding the Inspector General's concerns, um, I'm not familiar with, with very many complaints about how the credit hour worked prior to 2010 either. Um, so this is an effort to give more autonomy to colleges and to put this more squarely in the hands of accrediting agencies uh, so that they can make this distinction for the, they can define this for themselves. And with that, I think we're going to break for lunch. We'll pick up what we cut it left off here. I just want to remind everyone again with the badge, make sure you have it. It'll give you a little less hassle getting back into the building. Does everybody feel that an hour is sufficient? Uh, all right. Well, I'll, I will crack down. 40 minutes. Uh, I think, Dave, I think that Scott's correct. We're going to go. I was inclined to that anyway. But uh, uh, an hour and 15 minutes, that would get us back here at uh, 15 after 1, and we'll resume. Thank you very much. Thank you.